Hello everybody and welcome to another YouTube video. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make a website with Python. Now the goal of this video is going to be to give you a finished product that you can tweak and turn into whatever website you'd like. So I want to show you all of the fundamental and important things you need to know about web development with the module that we're going to use. So that way you can kind of take this starter or template website and turn it into whatever you want. So specifically, we're going to cover how you sign up users. So how you create new users account, how you store those in a database, how you log into those user accounts, how you log out of them, and then how you associate information with a specific user. So the example application that we're going to build here is just a very simple notes app. So we're going to have it. So you create an account. And then once you're signed in, you're able to add notes or make new notes. You can then delete those notes. And obviously you can sign out, you can log back in on whatever computer you want, and you can have access to those notes. Now, this is really simple. This isn't super exciting, but the point is to give you the knowledge to be able to make something that is more exciting, right? So this is just very fundamental. Most apps that you make are going to use like 90% of the code that we're going to write here. So it's a really great starter project. It's going to teach you a lot about web development. And again, that's kind of the goal here. Now, keep in mind that we're not really going to be focusing on front end too much. I have styled this slightly using something called Bootstrap just so that it does look somewhat decent. Uh, but this is not a front end tutorial at all. You don't need to know JavaScript for this. You don't even really need to know HTML although I will go over a little bit of HTML uh, and kind of the only prerequisite is you have some fundamental knowledge of Python because that's what we're going to be using for the back end of the website. So anyways, let me give you a quick demo of what we're going to be building here and then we'll actually jump into the code. So I have my website running. Uh, you can see that we can sign up for a new account or we can log in. So let's actually just make a new account. I'm going to say Tim three at you know, gmail.com is my email. My name is Tim. Let me set up a password and a password. Awesome. So I'm going to submit that I've created an account. It says my account was created successfully. I'm brought to this page that says notes and I can add a new note. So I'm going to say, Hey, there you go. That's my note. I'm going to say, you know, second note exclamation point, add my note. Now I can delete a note and notice that it gets deleted. The other one is still there. So now I can log out. If I try to go back to the slash home page, it's not going to let me cause I'm not signed in. But now if I sign in, so Tim three at gmail.com and I type in my password, we come back and we can see our notes. Now, of course, if we create another account, or in fact, I think I have another account, let's say Tim at gmail.com. Oops. Uh, you should see that we have different notes showing up here. Uh, okay. I, I don't have any notes for this account, but you can see that there is no notes here. So it, it's showing differently. Uh, but yeah, that's the basic idea. And that's what I'm going to be showing you how to do. So again, nothing super exciting or super crazy, but really important stuff. And once you know this again, you can go and make whatever you want. So hopefully you guys are excited. Let's go ahead and get started after a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get started, I need to thank Typing DNA for sponsoring this video. Typing DNA is a developer's first typing biometrics company that provides a low code authentication API that can authenticate users based on the way that they type. Their authentication API is available for free from their developer plan, which provides you with unlimited authentications and end users. Typing DNA works by recording typing biometrics data, which consists of timings and durations of various key press events. All new users will provide some baseline typing data when creating their account, and then that data can be used to verify their identity in the future. This allows users to authenticate their accounts without having to whip out their phone or mobile devices. Typing DNA is built for developers, provides seamless identity verification, and can help catch fraudsters instantly. It works great as two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Now to illustrate this better, let's try Typing DNA's demo. I'm first asked to create a dummy account by typing my email in a made-up password. As I type, Typing DNA records my typing biometrics. The next time I go to log in, it uses this data to authenticate my login. As well as Typing DNA's great API, they also have a Chrome extension that you can use as an extra security layer. Get started with Typing DNA today by signing up for a free developer account from the link in the description. All right, so let's dive in here. The first thing that we need to do is we need to make a folder that's going to store our application. So I've just made one on my desktop. I've called it Flask Web App Tutorial, and I've opened it up here in VS Code. Now, feel free to use whatever editor you want. I am using Visual Studio Code. It's just my preferred one right now for this type of project. Uh, but you can use Sublime, you can use Atom, you can use PyCharm, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. I'm um, just, you know, follow along with the steps that I'm doing here. 
So create a folder. And then the first thing we're going to do is just kind of set up a little bit of a project uh, directory or kind of some structure here just so that we have all the files defined already. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a folder inside of this folder. I'm going to call it website. This folder is going to store all of the code for our website, right? Then I'm going to make a new file. I'm going to call this file main.py. And this is the file that we are going to run when we want to start our web server or start our website. Now inside of website, I'm just going to make a few folders. We'll talk about these as we get to them. The first one is going to be called static. And then the next folder inside of website is going to be called templates. And then we make a few Python files. Uh, and again, we will jump into what all these mean in a second. So we're going to say underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi. Now this file right here has two underscores before the init and two underscores after. Make sure you don't only have one. And what this is going to do is it's going to make this website folder here a Python package. You'll see what that means as soon as we use the package parts of it. Uh, but it essentially means that we can import this folder here and whatever's inside of this init.py file will run automatically once we import this folder. Anyways, we're going to make a few more files and then we'll be done with kind of the basic setup. The first one we're going to do here is we're going to say auth.py. We're going to make another file here. We're going to call this one models.py. We're going to use this to store our database models. And then lastly, we're going to have a file called views.py. And this is going to store all of the main views or the URL endpoints for the actual functioning kind of front end aspect of our website. Anyways, that's the basic uh, kind of structure set up here. So make sure yours looks something like this. And then what we're going to do is install some packages. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a module called Flask. This module called Flask is just a super lightweight Python framework, essentially, uh, that allows you to make websites really quickly and really easily. If you're comparing it to something like Django, um, it's not necessarily as powerful and it's not used as much in production applications, but it's really good to know. It teaches you the fundamentals of web development. And for working on something like that we're doing here, building an MVP or even just building kind of a small website, Flask is great. And well, that's why I'm going to show it to you because it's just way more simple than Django and you can do things a lot faster with it. Anyways, to use Flask, we need to install the Python packages related to it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use pip. I'm just in a command line here in VS Code, but if you opened up CMD on Windows or Terminal on Mac, you could follow along with this. And we're going to install Flask. So we're going to say pip install Flask. Now run this command. Uh, I already have this installed, so you'll see that all these requirements are already satisfied. But what pip will do is just install a Python package for us. Now, if pip doesn't work for you, if for some reason you're getting pip is not recognized as a command, then what you need to do is go to the description. I have two videos, one for Mac and one for Windows that will show you how to fix pip. Now, they're not exactly called how to fix pip, but they will go through the steps in each video. Uh, so watch either of those depending on your operating system, and it should show you how to fix this command. Anyways, once we've done that and your pip's working, now we're going to install another module. This is called flask login. Uh, so flask hyphen login, going to install that. And there we go. Now we need one more module as well. The last one is called flask and then hyphen SQL alchemy. Uh, I think I spelt that correctly now. Yeah, there we go. So pip install flask SQL alchemy, hit enter, and we're going to install that. Now the modules we just installed or are for logging users in, as it said, and then SQL alchemy is actually a database thing that we can use. So it's kind of a wrapper for SQL that just makes it much easier for us to create database models, delete models, um, add models, whatever it may be. You'll see as we go through the video, but install those three things. And in case you guys get lost through this video, anything's not working, there is going to be all of the code linked in the description down below. Uh, so you can check that out on GitHub and, and you can copy all that code and everything. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to head into our init.py file and we're going to set up our Flask application. You're going to see how easy it is to do this. So we're going to start by saying from Flask, import Flask with a capital F like that. Then we're going to define a function. And we're going to call this function create app. So we're going to say define create app like that. Now inside of here, uh, we're going to initialize our app. So we're going to say app is equal to and then Flask and then inside of the brackets here, underscore, underscore name, underscore, underscore. Underscore underscore name just represents the name of the file, or I believe it was actually the name of the file that was ran. Um, so you, you'll see, but regardless, this is just how you initialize Flask. Uh, doesn't really matter what this means, just type it in the brackets. Okay, so app equals Flask underscore underscore name underscore underscore. Then what we're going to do after this uh, is we're going to set up one thing that we need for our app. So for all of our Flask applications, uh, we have this config variable called secret underscore key. And what this is going to do is this is going to kind of encrypt or secure the cookies and session data related to our website. Now, if you don't know what those mean, 
don't worry about it. You don't have to. Uh, but the idea here is that we just need to type some random string. It can be whatever we want. It could be a sentence. It could be one character uh, that is going to be the secret key for our app. Now in production, you would never want to share this secret key with anybody. But since we're just working on kind of the developer side here, doesn't matter. Make the secret key whatever you want. Obviously, I'm showing you mine. It's not that important. All right. So now that we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to return this app. So we're going to say return app. So we have now created a Flask application. We've initialized its secret key, and then we've returned it from this function. All right, so now that we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our main.py file, which is outside of this website folder, and we're going to import this website package, grab that create app function that we just defined, and then use that to actually, well, create an application and run it. So we're going to start by saying uh, from website import and then create underscore app. The reason we can do this is because website is a Python package. So whenever you put this init.py file inside of a folder, it becomes a Python package, which means when you import the name of the folder, it will by default run all of the stuff in the init.py file, which means we can import anything that's defined in this init.py file, like our create app. So from main.py, we can use create app. So we're going to say app equals create app. And then we're going to say if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals underscore underscore main underscore underscore and then we're going to say app dot run debug equals true now this is as easy as it is to run a flask application this will work we will now have a running web server and i'll show you in one second but what this line says is that only if we run this file not if we import this file so main.py are we going to execute this line the reason you want this is because if for some reason you were to import main.py from another file and you didn't have this line right here, it would run the web server. And you don't want that to happen. You only want it to run the web server if you actually uh, run this file directly. So that's what this line means. Now, what app.run is going to do is it's going to run our Flask application. It's going to start up a web server and it's going to say debug equals true, which means every time we make a change to any of our Python code, it's going to automatically rerun the web server. That's all the that debug equals true means. Obviously, you're going to turn that off when you're running in production. Uh, but for our cases, we want that on because that means we don't have to keep manually rerunning the uh, Flask web server. Awesome. So this is like the entry point for our app. So what we can actually do is I, I need to fix my Python interpreter first. And in fact, I'll show you how to do this in case you're in VS code and you're having some issues with Flask. Uh, if for some reason, you know, it's saying Flask module is not found or you just you can't use Flask. In fact, I'll show you if I run this file, uh, notice I get this error, no module named Flask. Your Python interpreter is probably just wrong. Now it shows you the interpreter in the bottom left hand corner. If you want to change this interpreter, which is probably what you want to do, you're going to hit control shift and P on your keyboard. That's going to open up the VS code command palette. And then inside of here, you're going to type Python and then select interpreter and you can select your Python interpreter. So the one that I want to use is 3.8.3. .3. Again, this is going to be specific to your local machine and the Python interpreters you have. But now that I select the correct interpreter, notice it changed down there and I can run this file. So now that I run this file, we get some output down here which is saying this is a development server. Do not use this in production, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it pretty much says, hey, your website is running. So now if we want to access our website, we need to go to this URL right here. So 127.0.0.1 port 5000. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to control and click on that. Uh, that's specific to VS Code. And it's going to open up this. So it says the requested URL was not found on the server. If you enter the URL manually, please check your spelling. That's fine. That's actually good. That means our web server is working. It just means that we don't have any roots or a home page or anything for our website. So that's what we need to add next. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create our first website root or our, yeah, I guess our first website root. So we're going to go to this views.py file and inside of this file, what we're going to do is we're going to store the kind of standard routes for our website. So where users can actually go to. So say the login page, say the home page, all of that kind of stuff. Actually, the login page story is going to go in auth because that's related to authentication. But anything that's not related to authentication and that the user can navigate to, we're going to put in this file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, by importing Flask. So I'm going to say from Flask import and then blueprint like that. And then I'm going to import uh, one more thing as well. Actually, uh, we'll import it later. I don't need it right now. So we're going to say from Flask import blueprint. Now, what we're going to do in here is we're going to define that this file is a blueprint of our application 
which simply means it has a bunch of roots inside of it. It has a bunch of URLs defined in here. That's literally all that a blueprint means. It's just a way to kind of separate our app out so we don't have to have all of our views defined in one file. We can have them defined in multiple files, split up and nicely organized. That's what blueprints allow us to do. So inside of this file, we're going to start by defining the name of our blueprint. So I'm going to say views is equal to blueprint. Now you don't need to name this the same thing as your file, but it's usually easier. It just keeps it really simple. So I would recommend you do that. So I'm saying my views blueprint. Well, it's, it's called views. Now inside of blueprint, I'm going to just define the name of my blueprint, which I'm going to call the same thing as my variable. Again, you don't have to call it this, but it's much easier just to call it the same thing. So I'd recommend that. And then after that, you're going to say underscore underscore name underscore underscore. That's all you need to do. We've now set up a blueprint for our Flask application. So you can ignore the name thing here if you don't understand what that means. Uh, but that is how you define the blueprint. So now what we'll do is I'm actually going to copy all of this. I'm going to go inside of my auth.py file. I'm going to do the exact same thing, except inside, instead of views, I'm going to call this auth. So now I've defined a views blueprint and an auth blueprint. Uh, and both of these will have different views or different URL story defined inside of them. So let's go back to views and let's define our first view. So to define a view or a root or whatever you want to call it uh, in Flask, what you're going to do is you're going to say at and then the name of your blueprint. So in this case, it's called views. If we were an auth, we would say at auth. And then we're going to say dot root. And inside of the function here or inside of the uh, the brackets, we're going to put the URL to get to this uh, this endpoint or I guess, yeah, like whatever the root is going to be. So in this case, we want to define for the home page. Uh, this is the root, so slash, and then we're going to define a function under here. So we're going to say define home. Now I should have done this before, but the point of this function is that this function will run whenever we go to the slash root. So whenever we go in our URL and we just type in slash, so we go to the main page of our website, whatever's inside of home is what's going to run. So that's the way that you can make this work. You define a function, you put what's called a decorator above it, you define the root, and then whenever you hit this root, it will call this function. So inside of here, we're going to do something really basic, and we're just going to return some HTML. So we're going to return the h1 tag, we're going to say test and then slash h1. What this will do is just return test as an h1 tag, uh, it will render this on the website when we go to the slash root. So that's as simple as it is. Of course, it will get more complicated. This is how you make your first root. So now we have these blueprints defined. But what we need to do is register these blueprints in our init.py. So from our app now, we need to tell Flask that, hey, we have some blueprints that are containing some different views for our application or some different URLs for our application. Here's where they are. So we're going to start by importing these files. So we're going to say from dot views import, and then we're going to import the name of the blueprint, which is views. So if I go to views, uh, you can see this is what we're importing this uh, variable right here. Okay, so let's go back. Now we'll do the same thing from auth. So we'll say from dot auth import auth. All right, so we've got our blueprints imported. Now what we're going to do is register them with our flask application. So We're going to say app dot register blueprint. And then we're going to put the blueprint like that. And we're going to say URL prefix is equal to we're just going to leave this at slash. So let me copy this and I'll do the same thing with auth. And there we go. We've registered our blueprints. Now the URL prefix is saying all of the URLs that are stored inside of these blueprints file. How do I access them? Do I have to go to a prefix specifically? So I'll just show you with an example because this is the easiest to explain it. If I would put slash auth and then say slash here or auth slash doesn't really matter. Then what would happen is I would have to go to auth and then slash and then whatever the name of my views inside of here were. So if I defined auth dot uh, view like that and or sorry, not view auth dot route like that. And then I put inside of here, let's say hello. If I wanted to access this route, since I define the URL prefix as auth, I would have to go to slash auth slash hello. So anything inside of here will be prefixed now by whatever I define as the URL prefix. So I don't want anything for the prefix. So I just leave it as slash, which means no prefix. Anyways, uh, hopefully we got that. So those that is how you register the blueprints. Uh, obviously, if you had more, you would register all of them and you can change the prefix according to what you have. But now I'm going to rerun the web server. So you can do that by just running this main.py file. Uh, I just did it in VS code with a shortcut, but not important. And now if I run this, notice that I get test. 
So I'm getting tests because I went to the slash root. So I just went to the home page of my website. And then what happened was we hit this function right here and we returned this HTML, which was test. And we showed that on the web page. So that is the most basic way to make a root. Now I'll show you how to make a few other routes and we'll do it inside of auth.py. So inside of auth.py, we're going to define our login, uh, log out and our, uh, what was the other one we need? Sign up. So we're going to say auth dot root. We're going to say slash login like that. And then we're going to define a function, call it whatever you want, but I usually just call it the same thing as the root. So login. And then here we'll just return some, let's go P tag. And this is going to say login like that. Now we'll define another root. So we'll say auth dot root. We're going to call this one slash log out. I'm going to say define log out. And then what are we going to return? Well, whatever we want, but I'll just return a P tag that says log out. Okay. And then lastly, we'll define our sign up. So auth dot root and then slash sign hyphen up and then define sign underscore up. And inside of here, we will return P tag that says sign up. All right, so there we go. We have now defined our three routes. So now if I rerun the server, just you'll notice that the server will crash if you have syntax errors in here. So sometimes you do need to rerun it, even though you have debug equals true. And in fact, to show you, if I, if I save this, notice how the server automatically reruns. That's what debug equals true does. Uh, but yeah, it's sometimes if you have syntax errors. You just have to re restart the server manually. So now that we have this, if I refresh test is working, I can now go to slash sign. Did I do sign hyphen up? Uh, yep, yeah, sign hyphen up. So that brings me there. I can go to login. We see we're at the login page and then I can go to log out and we see we're at the log out page. So clearly our roots are working. That's the most basic part of Flask, how you set up your roots and your URLs. All right. So now that we have our URLs set up, what we want to do is we want to start making our pages look a little bit nicer, right? So I don't really want to just show login, log out, sign up. I want to show an actual page. So how do I render some real HTML from an HTML file? Because it doesn't really make sense for me to be, you know, putting all the HTML in a string in Python. We're not going to do that. That's not scalable for our app. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go inside of this templates folder. And this is where we're going to put what we call our HTML templates. So in Flask, uh, you could call them HTML documents. Doesn't really matter. Uh, when you render HTML, you call it a template. And the reason you call it a template is because there's a special templating language that you can use with Flask, which is called Jinga. So J I N J A. I believe that's how you spell it. This templating language allows you to write a little bit of Python inside of your HTML documents. Now, this is really useful because this means that you don't need to know JavaScript and you can say render all of a user's notes without using JavaScript. You can display user information without using JavaScript. You can do a bunch of stuff without using JavaScript based on this templating language. Now, you will see how this works as we really get into this. Uh, but let me start by defining a new file. I'm going to call this base.html. So typically when you make templates, what you do is you define a base template. Now you can think of the base template as like the theme of your website. So whatever you have in this base template is what your entire website is going to look like. So usually a nav bar, maybe a footer or a header or something like that. And then what you will do is you will override parts of the base template with more specific templates. Now, I know this is confusing because I haven't shown anything yet, but the idea is that we have one section of the base template, which is usually the main content on the page. And what we'll do is we'll let our other HTML documents override that main content. So everything else stays the exact same, except the main content of the page will change based on what page we're on. So anyways, let's just start typing out our HTML document. And this is a lot of um, stuff that you're going to probably have to copy, uh, especially the style sheet and the JavaScript and all of that. So do go to the description and open up the GitHub. Uh, you can type along with me if you want, of course, but it might be a little bit easier just to uh, what do you call it? Just to copy some of this stuff because I, I can't really type all of it out. Anyways, we're going to set up our HTML tags here after our doc type HTML. We're going to start by setting up a head tag and then we'll set up a body tag. So we'll say body and body. If you're unfamiliar with HTML, this is just standard practice. You need a head tag, which has like metadata related to the website. Uh, and then you have a body tag, which actually has the HTML for the body of the website. So the first thing we're going to do inside of our head tag is we're going to define a meta. So we're going to say meta and then char set equals UTF eight. So just defining the character set that's used for this document. 
then what we're going to do is have another meta. We're going to say meta and then name equals viewport. And we're going to say that the content is equal to and then width equals device hyphen width. So pretty much just saying take up the entire width of the screen. And then after this, we're going to have a comma. We're going to say initial hyphen scale equals one. Now, I'm not going to explain this because this is not a tutorial on HTML. You're welcome to look that up if you want. But these are just standard things that you almost always have uh, in your head tag. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to import what's known as Bootstrap. Now, Bootstrap is a uh, CSS framework that has some built in classes that just make it a lot nicer to style your website. Again, this is not a tutorial on front end or bootstrap, so I don't want to get into it too much. But what this is right here is a link to what's called a CDN. Now, a CDN is a content delivery network. Uh, and what that will do is it will allow you to actually load without downloading the file a bunch of custom CSS and JavaScript. Now, in this case, we're just loading CSS and we can tell that because this is defined as a style sheet. And this style sheet will contain a bunch of classes that we can use for our HTML elements just to make them look a lot nicer. So what you need to do is just copy this. Again, you can get that from the code link in the description. You're also welcome to not use this. Everything will still work if you don't have this CSS. It's just not going to look as nice. So we have the uh, two CSS things defined now. So we've loaded our style sheet. We've loaded Bootstrap. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a title tag. And inside of this title tag, I'm going to show you the first thing that you can do with Jenga, which is the templating engine. So I'm going to define two brackets like this and then two percent signs. Now, whenever you're using Jenga, you have a few different kind of syntax options. So when you're writing a block or you're writing some Pythonic syntax, like a for loop or an if statement, you usually put them inside of this. So you have uh, open squiggly or whatever you want to call it, squiggly bracket brace, then percent sign and then percent sign and then close squiggly brace. Now inside of here, you can define a bunch of different things. So you can actually write an if statement in here. Uh, you could write what else? A for loop. Uh, you can write an expression that you want to evaluate or you can write what's called a block. So I'm going to say block title. And what this means is I'm defining a block in this base template that can be overridden in a child template. So what's kind of going to happen is our children template are going to inherit this base template and any blocks that we've defined inside of this base template, they'll be able to change. So for example, the title of our website, we obviously want them to be able to change this. So we'll say block title and then we'll say end block inside of this title tag. And what this means is now in my child template, I can define this same block. And when I define this block, anything that I write inside of it, say like home right there, um, will override whatever is inside of here. So if in my child template, I wrote, say, sign up or log in as uh, as the block title, it would override what is inside of here. So it would remove home and then it would put whatever I typed. Um, will make sense as we actually get into the template. But this is kind of how you define blocks and what I mean by having templates that you can reuse and, and defining a base template. All right. So now that we have finished the head, let's go to the body. We're going to define a nav bar. And then what we're going to do after that is load a bunch of scripts. And in fact, I'm going to load all of the scripts first. Uh, so let's load all of these. You're going to have to copy these because I can't uh, type them all out. And what this is going to load is the JavaScript related to what do you call it here? Bootstrap, <laughs> the CSS framework. So Bootstrap has some like fancy animations and some just like cool button presses and stuff uh, that use JavaScript. Uh, so what you need to do is load in these scripts. Again, just take that from the description from the code. So this we load at the bottom of our body tag. So make sure it's at the very bottom. All other HTML you're going to put above it. Now, let's say you're someone who wanted to write your own JavaScript. First of all, what you would do if you want to integrate your own JavaScript into this, and I'll just cover this quickly because I know some of you will want to do this, is you will put a JavaScript file inside of this static folder. So any assets like images or JavaScript files uh, or CSS, things that are static that, that do not change, you put inside of this static folder. So again, images, JavaScript or CSS files, you have to put inside of the static folder. Now, once you put them inside of the static folder, you can load them in your HTML by doing something like this. So this is the script that you would write to load in a file called index.js from this static folder. So what you do is you write these two squiggly brackets, uh, which is another thing in Jenga, and I'm going to cover this in one second. You write URL for, then you put the name of the folder, which in this case is static, and then the file name that you want to load, which is index.js. 
Now, what this URL for function does, this is actually a Python function, okay? We'll see it in a minute, is it loads the URL for the static folder. So it, it just finds that on our website. That's what it does. Now, these two squigglies, uh, or <laughs> squiggly brackets, I keep calling them squigglies, what this means is that we are going to write a Python expression. So whenever I have two squigglies like this, this pretty much means we can write a variable, we can write a function, we can write some kind of Python expression that will be evaluated. Now there's some rules for the type of Python expression you can write in here, but that's the idea behind these two squiggly brackets. Uh, whenever you have them is you can write some Python expression that will be evaluated. So when I put that inside of here, it will evaluate this and there will be some string that is actually source. And that uh, string will represent the file name index.js. So if I made index.js here, it, it would load this file. So I put any JS that I want inside of here. Anyways, enough on that. I apologize about talking that for a long time. Okay, so now that we've done that, what we're gonna do is go inside of the body and we're gonna decide, we're gonna define a nav bar. So we're gonna create a nav bar. So we're going to say nav, we're gonna say class is equal to, and then nav bar, and then nav bar hyphen expand hyphen LG. Now these are all bootstrap classes. If you want to see how exactly these work and why I've picked them, you can go to the bootstrap website and you can look up navbar. You can look up a bunch of different things and it shows you a bunch of really detailed examples of how to create this stuff. So I haven't come up with this. I've just taken this from the bootstrap website uh, and this will create a nice kind of gray navbar as you saw. So now we'll say navbar hyphen dark. So change the color of the navbar and then BG hyphen dark to make it dark. All right. So now we have a navbar defined. Uh, that's as easy as it is to make one. And now we have to put some buttons on our nav bar. So the first thing that I want to put is actually a button that will allow us to expand the nav bar if we're on a mobile device. So let's say that our screen is really small and we can't fit all of the nav bar items on the nav bar. Then what we need to do is have a button that can expand the nav bar so we actually see all of the different buttons. So that's what this is going to do uh, that I'm going to define here. So I'm going to say button. And then I'm going to say the class is equal to toggle, uh, sorry, nav bar hyphen toggle. So pretty straightforward. It's going to toggle the nav bar. We're going to say the type is equal to a button. We're going to say that the data hyphen toggle is equal to, and then in a string, we're going to say collapse. We're going to say that the data hyphen target is equal to, and then we're going to put a pound sign, which stands for the ID of something. And then we're going to say nav bar because the ID of our nav bar, uh, which we will define in one second is going to be called nav bar. Anyways, we have nav bar like that. Then uh, there's some other things that we could add, but actually I think this is fine for now. Okay. So data toggle data target. Okay. Now that we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to close the button tag. So slash button. And inside of here, we're actually going to put the icon that we want to use for this button. So we're going to say span class equals and then nav bar hyphen toggler hyphen icon. And then we'll just end the span. Uh, I guess we can just do like that to end the span tag. So what this will do is this is just going to load an icon for us. And then since it's inside of the button tag, that's what will show up when we press on this icon, it will toggle the button. So when you save, uh, you should see that it auto formats for you. If you're not getting auto formatting in VS code, uh, go to the VS code marketplace, which is just this thing with little cubes here and install an extension called prettier. Uh, if you install this, uh, you won't even, I think you just need to reload VS code after you install it. And then when you save, it should automatically format the document for you so that you don't have to deal with all the indentation and all that stuff. Okay. So now that we have that, let's define the navigation items in our nav bar. So we're going to make a div and we're going to say div class is equal to, and then collapse and then nav bar hyphen collapse. And then we're going to say the ID is equal to nav bar. So what this is saying is that we're going to have a collapsible nav bar, which I will show you once we actually build it. And then we'll define the items that we want in this cl uh, collapsible nav bar. So let's define a, another div inside of here. So I'm going to say div class equals and then nav bar hyphen nav. So this is the actual navigation items. We'll end the div and then inside of here, we'll define the items that we want. So I'm going to say a, which is just a link. I'm going to say class is equal to and then nav hyphen item and then nav hyphen link, meaning that this actually links to something. I'm going to say the ID of this is login and then you can guess the href. So where this is actually going to redirect us to is slash login. 
So that's it for A, and then we will say log in, and we will close the A tag. All right, so now let's copy this, uh, and let's put this a few times. So we have log in. The next one we want is sign up. So we'll just say the ID of this is sign up, or maybe we'll just do camel case there. And then the page we want to redirect to is sign hyphen up. This is going to be called sign up. Okay, after that, we want home and we want log out. So let's put log out here. Let's just change this to log out and log out. And then lastly, we will do home. So home, home, and then we can simply just put slash because that is our home page. All right, so now we should have a nav bar. So our server is still running. So make sure yours is running. You may have to rerun it. And if we go and we refresh the page, well, we don't see anything for logout and we don't see anything for slash, right? That's because, well, we've defined this HTML document, but we haven't actually used it. So now that we've defined this, we want to use this document. So this is a template. Remember, we defined this as a template. And what we need to do now is actually define some HTML documents that can use this template because yes, we can actually render this template, uh, which I will show you in a second, but I want to show you how we use this template because the whole idea was this is going to be the base template of our entire website. So I'm going to define another template here or another HTML document. I'm going to call this home.html. Now inside of here, what I'm going to do is show you how we extend this template. So remember, we have this block here, this, this title block. Uh, and inside of home, what I need to do is I need to extend this base template. So I'm going to write uh, the two squiggly brackets and then percent percent and inside of here. I'm going to say extends and then base dot HTML as a string. What this means is that this template right here is going to be the exact same as base dot HTML and I can override any blocks that were defined inside of base dot HTML. So I can take this block title and I can put this right here. And now if I define instead of home, uh, well, actually, sorry, this, this should be home, but let's just make it uh, change so that we can see that this did actually work. If I make this changed now, this is simply going to override the title block from base.html, but everything else will stay the exact same. So now let's go into views.py and let's actually render this template so that we can see it on the screen. So whenever we want to render a template, what we do is we need to import the render underscore template function. And from our views function, we're going to return render template and then just the name of our template. So we don't need to do template slash or anything like that. We just do home.html, which is the name of our HTML template. And now when we go to this page, it's going to render the HTML inside of home.html. Uh, now there's a few more things that you can do with templates, which we will get to in a minute, but that's the basics. So let's run this and let's refresh and notice we get some nav bar uh, that is collapsible. Now this icon does not look exactly how I wanted it to look, but notice that when I press this icon, all of the uh, the roots are popping up. So I'm going to have a look and see what I've messed up here because this should not be uh, looking like this right now. So there's definitely a change or something that we made a mistake with. So I'll be back after I look at that. All right. So I was able to fix it. There was just a few typos. Um, you guys probably saw them when I did them, but First on line 23 here in the in the HTML, I had navbar toggle. This should be navbar toggler. That's the class. That's why this was looking all weird. And then inside of here on line 30, I had spelled collapse wrong. So just make sure you spell everything correctly. I had collapse and then navbar and then I had the A and the P mixed up. So they were like that. So obviously it wasn't working because, well, <laughs> everything was spelled incorrectly. So I spelled collapse correctly now, uh, spelled toggler correct. And now we should be good to go. So now let's load the website here uh, and you can see that as soon as my page gets really small, it shows me this button and then I can expand the nav bar to see everything. And then if I make it large enough, I can see all the items on the nav bar. Now also look at the title of our website up here. It says changed. The reason it says changed is because we loaded not the base.html template, but the home.html template and we over uh, overrode this block here and we called it changed instead of uh, home. So that's it. That's how you render the template. Now let's add a block into our base.html template. I want to add it right under the nav bar that we can override to actually put content on the screen. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a div. I'm going to say div and I'm going to say class equals and I'm going to make this a container. Now the container will just make it such that the content is kind of floating off of the border of the screen. It's just it doesn't center it, but it just makes it so there's a little bit of padding between it and the nav bar and the, the edge of the screen. And then inside of this container class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a block and I'm going to say block content. 
You can call these blocks whatever you want. So name them whatever you want. Doesn't have to be content. And then here I'm going to end the block. So now anything that I put inside of here would show up on the screen if I rendered base.html. But it also allows me to override anything in here. So now if I take this block and I go to and I just saved and you can see that where did that put that? Oh, it's just all in line here. Uh, if I go to h uh, base.html or sorry, home.html, what am I saying? Inside of here, now I can add an h1 tag and I can just say this is the home page. So now that I do this, you'll see as soon as I refresh here that we get this is the home page showing up on the home page. So now if I go to log out, notice that the template's not here because we still are just rendering the HTML for logout, uh, but that's how this works. So that's how you deal with templates. And hopefully that was uh, somewhat informative. All right, so now let's show how we can actually render the template for all of our views. So we have our home page, but if we go to auth.py, we don't want to show all this boring HTML. We want to show the template for login, for logout, and for sign up. So let's create two more templates. Let's make one called login.html and let's make one called signup.html. Uh, sign underscore up. HTML. Now we're not going to make one for logout because when you actually press that button, it's just going to redirect you somewhere else. There's not going to be like a page that it shows. Uh, I was just doing that for example, but you get the idea. So let's go to our home.html and let's literally just copy all of this. First of all, let's make the title correct in home.html. And now for sign up and for login, I'm going to paste these in. So we'll start in login. We'll just change the name to say login and we'll say this is the login page. Very good. Now we go to sign up. We can change this to sign up and change this to this is the sign up page. Great. So now that we have that, let's render these templates. So let's go to auth.py. Let's import render template and let's use it. So now let's say render underscore template. And what template are we going to render? The login.html. We can copy this and do the same thing for sign up. And now we will render sign underscore up dot html. All right, so now that we've done that, let's load. So let's refresh. Let's go to sign up. This is the sign up page. Let's go to login. This is the login page. And there you go. That is the basics. So now that we've talked about that, we understand how to use templates. Let's now discuss how we can actually pass values to templates. So one of the great things about this Jenga templating language is that we can pass variables or values right to all of these templates. And then what that will do is we can actually use those values inside of the templates. So let's say I want to pass um, like it's hard to give a, a good example right now because we don't have anything meaningful to pass. But I'm just going to show you how we can pass a variable to say login.html from our back end right here and how we can display it on the page. So on login.html, what you can do here is you can quite simply write any variable name that you want. So doesn't matter. Hello could be arg, could be string, whatever. As long as it's a valid variable name, type whatever you want. Uh, so let's just go with text. And then I'm going to say that's equal to set it equal to whatever you want. So I'm going to set this equal to testing. And now that I've done this inside of my login.html template, I can access the variable text. So if I go to login.html, what I can do is I can use my fancy squiggly brackets that denote I'm having a Python expression inside of here, and I can type the name of the variable that I'm expecting to be passed, which is text. So if I do this, what's going to happen now is whatever is passed to this template with the value text. So again, text equals testing will show up here uh, Oops, uh, in these squiggly brackets or, or where they're located. So if I run this now and we uh, refresh, we see testing shows up. So this is how you pass values to your templates. You simply define them as some variable and, and literally just type it out like this. So text equals testing. Now, there's a few other ways to do this. I'm not really going to go through all of them, at least right now, but we can also pass multiple variables. So I can pass text and I could pass, um, you know, user is equal to, and then I'll pass Tim. So now that I've passed this, I can go to my login template. And after this, I can just say user. Now that I have user there, if I run this, we get testing and then we get Tim, right? So I can just show the user. Now, I also could do something like user plus and then S. Now, what this will do is it will interpret whatever the user variable is plus the string S and it will display that. 
So now we get Tim's, right? So there is a limitation to what you can do inside of here. You can't do everything you would do in regular Python, uh, but for the most part, you can do like some basic expressions, display variables, and that's what makes this templating language really useful. So that is the basic um, for that. Now let's show one more thing with templates while we're at it. Uh, I want to pass a variable here and we'll just call this Boolean and we'll make this equal to true. Now I'll show you how we can actually write an if statement inside of our template. So if we want to write an if statement, uh, which we'll do here, let me just move the block down uh, to write an if statement. We do the percent type of block and then we say if and then whatever variable we want to check or whatever expression we want to check. So in this case, I want to see if the Boolean variable is equal to true. So if Boolean is equal to true, then what I can do is underneath this block, I can write out what I want to do. I'll just say, yes, it is true. And then to end my block, I can say end block like that, or sorry, not end block, but end if. So this is how you write an if statement. Uh, you do the percent kind of thing. You say if whatever the expression is you want to check, then end the percent thing. And then you write whatever inside of here you want to display if this is true or whatever you want to do if this is true. And then you have the end if to signify, hey, I'm ending this if statement because obviously we can't use indentation to do that. So now if I refresh, we'll see that yes, it is true. But if I change is Boolean equal to false, so let's do that. You'll notice that when I run this, nothing shows up because that condition was not true. So that is how you write an if statement. If you want to do an if else, then you can do this. You can say else, and then you can say, no, it is not true. And you don't need to write like end else or anything like that. You just have an end if at the very end of all of the statements. And now let's run this. We have, yes, it is true. And if we change this to false, just to get into the else statement here, we see, no, it is not true, right? So that is how that works. That's how the if and else works. Now I hate the formatting by default for uh, Jenga in here. Like it is kind of difficult to read, but hopefully you get the idea. And that's how you write if and else. I'll show you four loops later. Uh, and then you can do an else if as well. I may be incorrect on this. I should probably look this up, but it's percent percent. And then I think it's either L if or else if. All right, so it looks like it actually is just L if. So if you say L if, and then whatever the other condition is you wanna check, uh, then this works. And then if you didn't have an else, you would just have the end if at the end, but the end if just goes at the very end of all the statements and this works just like regular Python. So you have if, L if, else, or as many L ifs as you want. Again, you don't need the L if, you don't need the else, and end if goes at the very end. Anyways, let's get rid of these because I don't actually want these. And uh, that's just what I want to show you how you pass values to the template. All right, so now we've learned about templates. We know how to pass values to templates. We know how to do template inheritance. We know how to you know, use expressions and all of that inside of the templates. Let's now create our actual sign up template. So I want to actually make the form here because if we design this, then we can start working on the back end and we can actually, you know, create the user account and work with databases and all that interesting stuff. So we need to build this form out. So first of all, we have our blocks defined. Now inside of our block content, we're just going to build an HTML form. So we're going to say form, we're going to say method equals post, which means when we submit this form, send a post request to the back end. Uh, you don't have to know what that means yet, but I will discuss post get and all of that. And anyways, inside of here, let's start by having an H3 tag. So let's say H3, let's say align equals center. We want this to be in the middle of the screen and let's end our H3 tag. And then let's say sign up. So now we have a header for our form that says sign up. Now I want to have a div. So I'm going to say div. The class of this is going to be equal to form hyphen group. Uh, this is just a bootstrap class that we can use. I'm going to end the div. And inside of this div, I am going to start putting my fields. So I want an email address, a first name, a password, and a password to, so like your, your password confirmation. And that's what I want for my sign up form. So email, first name, two passwords. So let's start by defining a label. Let's say label. This is going to be for our email. Uh, you just would set this equal to the class that you're going to use for the input field, which you'll see in a second. Let's end our label and let's call this one email address. All right, now inside of here, I'm going to define input fields. So I'm going to say input. I'm going to say type equals email. I'm going to say class equals and then form hyphen control. Again, this is another bootstrap class. You can look up all these classes from the bootstrap website. I'm going to say the ID equals email. I'm going to say the name equals email. Notice there's a lot of stuff to type here. And the placeholder is equal to enter email. 
uh, like that. Okay, and actually, let's go lowercase e. Enter email. How many times did I spell it incorrectly? All right, so now we have our input field. Now, what you need to make sure you do here is you need to define a name. The reason you need to define a name as well as an ID, and in fact, the ID is optional, but you should add it because then you have your label linking with your input field, which is what you want. But what the name will do for us is this is actually what the attribute is going to be called when we pass the information in this field to our backend. Now, that might be confusing, but when we submit this form, it's going to bundle up all of the information in here and it's going to use all of the names of these fields to represent them when it actually sends this information to the back end. So we will be able to access the email address by whatever its name is defined as. So make sure you define these names uh, and then that you know what these names are. So now that we have our first form group defined, we're going to copy this and let's do the next one. So we have the same div called form group, except now we don't have an email. We have a first name. So we'll just say first name like that. Change the type to not be email, but just to be text. And then the class will stay the same. The ID will go to first name. The name should always be the same as the ID for our purposes. We're going to say first name and then we'll just say enter first name. All right, awesome. Let's copy this one and now let's do the passwords. Okay, so we I just copied it twice because we're going to do two two passwords. So we'll say for password one, the label is going to be password. The type is going to be password. The ID is going to be password one. And then the name is going to be password one. Okay, and then for here, we'll just say enter password. And then actually we should probably just copy this one because all we'll have to do is change password one to password two. So now uh, password, I'll just say confirm as the label. We'll say instead of password one, this will just all be password two. And we'll just say instead of maybe instead of enter password, maybe we should say confirm password. Awesome. So now we have our sign up form created. So now the last thing we need to add is a button. So after this div, I'm going to add a break line just to separate the button. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say button type equals submit class equals and then btn btn hyphen primary. This is just going to make kind of a nice blue button. Uh, and again, these are bootstrap classes that I'm using. And I'm going to say submit and then slash button. So there we go. Now we have that defined. If we go to our website and I was just looking up the, the Jenga syntax before you can see that uh, and I go to sign up. Notice this is the form that we get. So it looks pretty nice. And if I press submit, uh, you'll see we get something popping up. Don't worry about that right now, but this does indeed work and we have our form. Now, just to be really clear here, uh, the reason why I can use all these bootstrap classes is because my base template, which I'm inheriting from, has all these links, right? So I'm linking to bootstrap. That's what we did in those first steps when we added all these links and we added all these scripts. That's why I'm able to use all this nice, fancy stuff. So I just want to make sure that's clear uh, in case I skimmed over that and you guys are wondering, you know, how it looks this nice. It's because we're using a CSS framework called Bootstrap. Again, this is not focused on front end. Um, I just wanted to show you or just talk about what Bootstrap is for a second. OK, now we have sign up. So, you know what, while we're in our HTML and, and we're going through and doing all this, let's just do the login because it's going to be very similar to sign up. In fact, let's actually copy this entire sign up form uh, and we'll just modify it slightly in login. So for login, let's replace all of our content here with this form. And now let's remove one of these passwords because we don't need two passwords, obviously. And let's remove first name. And we should be good. So now we have email uh, and we have password. We'll change the name instead of password one to just be password. And there we go. And then we will change the uh, the sign up field here to be a login. There we go. And email that should be all good. So I think that's actually all we need for the login field. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we should change. Maybe we'll change submit to login and that should be our login page. So now that we have that, let's load the login page and we can see this is what our login page looks like. So looking nice. Awesome. That is great. OK, so now that we have that, We've done most of the HTML that we need to write. I hate writing HTML, but we just we do have to do it. Uh, now we can actually go to Python and we can start handling this form. So notice, actually, let me go back to the website here. When I press login or I go to sign up, 
and I press submit. We get method not allowed. This method is not allowed for the requested URL. So this is a great point in time to talk about HTTP requests. So when we're talking about websites, uh, we use something called HTTP, right? Which I believe is hypertext transfer protocol. I think that's what it stands for, something like that. And anyways, HTTP, there's a bunch of different methods that you have with them. So you have a get request or a get method, a post request or a post method, a put request or a put method, and then delete. And there's a few other ones as well. There's an update method and some more. Now, all of these methods can be used for whatever you want. But the point of these methods is so that you can clearly distinguish between what type of requests are being sent to your website. Because what really happens here, right, is when we go to something in our URL address bar, we hit some endpoint or some function or some root on our server, right? And in this case, our roots are login, login, uh, log out, sign up, uh, you know, home, all of that. Now, these roots need to know whether we sent them a get request or whether we sent them a post request or whatever it was, because based on the type of request, they're going to do something differently. Now, typically, a get request is when you're just loading a website. So when you're loading a web page or you're retrieving information. Now, in our case, when we go to this web page, we're retrieving the HTML that represents this page. Now, a post request usually means that you're making some kind of change to a database or some kind of change to the state of your website or the state of the system or whatever it may be. So we would post the fact that we are signing in or that we are signing up and when we post, that means we are sending a post request with all of the information in our form. So if I go here uh, and let's go to sign up, the reason why we were getting that error message is because when we hit this button, we are actually by default because we defined uh, method equals post. Let me find this inside of our form. We're going to be sending a request to the URL that we're currently on. So to sign up, that is a post request that has all of the information here. So the email address, the first name, and the two passwords that we typed in, it's gonna send that to our server. So our server needs to interpret that and then respond to us or do something based on that post request. So hopefully that's clear, but those are some of the main HTTP methods and that's kind of how they work. A, a get request is retrieving information, a post request is updating or, or creating something, and then you have update, delete, put, a bunch of other HTTP requests, which we're not gonna use in this video, but you're welcome to look up and are pretty straightforward in how they work. So let's go now and, and let's make sure that we can actually accept this post request. So if I go to uh, views.py or sorry, auth.py, my bad. Now what we want to do is we want to make sure that login and sign up are able to accept post requests. So to do that, we need to define something inside of our root that says methods and is equal to a list. And inside of here, we're going to write the strings for the type of request that this root can accept. Now, by default, we can only accept get requests, but now when we add get and we add post here, we are able to accept get and post requests. So let's copy this. Let's put this to sign up. And now what this means is we are able to uh, accept get and post requests from both of these routes. So if I go and I refresh and I press submit now, notice that it just reloads the page, right? Because we sent a post request and it simply returned to us the, the rendered template again, right? That, that's all that happened when we sent the post or we sent the get request. So to be clear, when I go to this URL from the URL bar, this is a get request. When I press this submit button, this is a post request because I'm sending the information to the server. All right. So now let me show you how we get the information from this form on the server. Now, what we do is we need to start by importing something called request uh, at the top of our Flask application. So if we want to get the information that was sent in this form, we can do the following. We can say that data is equal to request.form. So this request variable uh, is whenever you access it inside of a root, it will have information about the request that was sent to access this root. So it will say the URL, it will say the method, it will say all of the information that was sent. And in this case, we can access the form attribute of our request which has all of the data that was sent as a part of a form. So here I can say data equals request.form, and then I can print data. Now you're going to notice that we may get an issue here uh, because I'm doing this regardless of the fact if I'm sending a get request or I'm sending a post request. If a get request or post request comes in, we're not differentiating between them. We just do the same thing. All right. So now that I have this line, sorry, I, I got a little confused there. I'm going to go to login. Uh, and what I'm going to do, is I am going to send some information. So I'm going to say Tim at Gmail. I'm just going to say one, two, three, four. 
and I'm going to press login. Now notice it should print uh, the data here. So if I log in, then notice here we get printing out an immutable dict object uh, or mutable multi dict that has the email, which is Tim at Gmail one uh, or Tim at Gmail and then password one, two, three, four. So that is how we access information from the server here. We can look at the request.form attribute. And if we sent any data or there was a form attribute, then we print it out. Now, the one thing to keep in mind here is that this is only going to work. It's only going to give us data if we actually send a form, right? So if I, if I go here and I, I just refresh this and I look at my immutable dictionary, we don't have any data inside of it. The reason we don't have any data inside of it is because we sent a get request. And while there was no form attribute in that get request, we didn't, we didn't have any data we sent with the get request. But when I send the post request and I press log in, we get our email and we get our password. So hopefully that's clear, but now let's look at how we can do this on the sign up page, how we can get users information and store that in a database and create their user account. So the first thing we want to do, and I'm going to delete this from login. I'm going to go to sign up and I want to differentiate between my uh, get request and my post request. So to do that, I'm going to say if request.method is equal to an all capitals post, then I want to do something specific. So if it's a post request, do something. If it's a get request, do something else. That's what I'm checking. So inside of here, the first thing I want to do is get all of the information from my form. So I want the email, first name and the two passwords. So I'm going to say email equals and then request dot form. And then you use this method called dot get to get a specific uh, attribute or specific value. So we're going to get email. We're then going to say first name equals request dot form dot get. And we're going to get first name. Then I want password. So I'm going to say password is equal to request.form.get. And I want password one. So let's call this password one. And then we want password two. So we'll do the same thing. Password two equals request.form.get. And then password two. Awesome. So now we're going to get all this information. So we will get the email, uh, first name, password one, and password two from our sign in form. Then what I want to do is I want to start by making sure that this information is valid. So if this information is not valid, uh, then I don't want to create a new user account. But if it is valid, then I do. So let's just do a, a few very basic Python checks here. Let's say if the len of email is greater than, let's say, four characters, then we're all good to go. All right. We'll say if it's less than four characters, then we will kind of tell the, uh, the user that there's an issue. I'm not going to do that this second, but I'll show you how we do that. And we'll say L if the uh, the len of first name is less than two. So if it's only one character or it's zero characters, that's no good. But we'll, we'll do something else if that's the case. And then we'll say elif password one does not equal password two. Then we want to tell the uh, user there's an issue. And then maybe we want to have like a length on the password. We'll say elif the len of password one is less than seven characters. Then there's an issue. Otherwise, we'll say add user to database. So if all is good, we can add the user to the database. So what I want to show you now before we actually go ahead and do this is how we can kind of alert the user if something went wrong. So they're sending us this request and saying, hey, I want to make a new account and we want to check to make sure all this information is valid. And if this information is not valid, well, we should pop something up on the screen and t tell them, hey, no, that's no good. You can't do that. Now, this is where we get into something called message flashing, which is a really cool part of Flask. I think you can do it in Django too, although I'm not sure. So what you're allowed to do, or, or I guess what you can do is you can flash a message on the screen uh, using Flask. It has like some built in functionality for it. So to flash a message, what you do is you import something called flash and then you use this function uh, whenever you want to flash a message. So on 25, if I want to flash a message that says, hey, you know, your email is too short, then all I do is I say flash and I say uh, email must be greater than four characters. OK, and then I can define a category for this flash. So if this is like a successful message, then what I would do is the category equal to success. And if this is a failure message or a message where there's an error, then I would use the category error. Now you can name these categories whatever you want. Um, like they're up to you. You can name them E, you can name them one, you can name them two, so long as you know what they mean, because uh, we're going to use these categories to display these messages in a different color. Anyways, let's flash a bunch of messages here. So we'll flash here and now we'll say first name must be greater than two characters. 
uh, or must be greater than one character, sorry, and this one really should be three, that's correct. Then after this for password, we'll flash, hey, your passwords don't match. So we'll say uh, passwords don't match and I need to escape this. So just use an escape character like that. Then we'll do another flash and we will say that password is too short. Password must be at least seven characters. And all these are error messages, right? And then otherwise, uh, let's flash a successful message. Uh, now we will actually have to do something else here. We'll say account created exclamation point category equals and then success. All right, so there we go. We, we flash a bunch of messages now. If this does work, I'm just going to remove this pass. Uh, and this is only if there's a post request, right? And then regardless, at the end, we return the signup.html template. So now let me show you how we actually see these flashed messages. Because if I just run this right now, these aren't going to do anything. Uh, nothing's going to happen because we haven't displayed these messages. So I'm just going to rerun the server. I'm going to go into my uh, base.html template. So let's find that here. And I'm going to write a kind of block of code. Uh, where is base? I, I meant to load this up here. Uh, that is going to actually let me show these flashed messages. So underneath the nav bar, but above my main content is where I want to show these messages. So I'm going to write a for loop uh, and I'm going to do the following, or sorry, I'm going to write, you'll kind of see, I just have to write it out and then I can discuss, discuss it. I'm going to say with messages equal to get underscore flashed underscore messages. And then we're going to say with underscore categories is equal to, and then a lowercase true. Notice this is lowercase, not capital. This is a, a difference in Jenga. You use lowercase capitals, right? Or lowercase capitals. Use lowercase uh, for the first letter for true and false. So we're going to say get flash messages with categories equals true. And then we're going to end the with statements. So we're going to say like that end with. Now what this is going to do is just going to define a variable called messages, which is equal to get flashed messages. This is a function that we can just write out because it's built into flask. And this is going to get all of the messages that we have flashed. Sometimes there may be multiple. Uh, and then we will display or we will get those messages with their category. Sorry. Now what we will do is we will loop through all of the messages because we could again have multiple messages and uh, we will display them on the screen. So I'm going to start by saying, first of all, we need to make sure we actually have some messages, right? So if messages, and then I'm going to end this if. So if we do actually have messages, if it's not just empty, then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through them. So we're going to say for message in messages, just like in regular Python, except we don't need the, uh, the colon at the end. And then we're going to end the for statement. So you're going to say end for like that. Now, what we'll do inside of here is we will write some HTML that will just display whatever the message is. So I'm going to write a div. I'm going to say div and then class is equal to this is an alert. So in bootstrap, we have something called alert. So I'm going to say alert and then alert hyphen danger. So this is an error message. And then this is going to be a dismissible alert. So alert hyphen dismissable like that. And then we're going to say fade and then show. Now, what this will do uh, is it will fade in the alert. It will allow us to uh, dismiss the alert and then it will be shown by default. Then we will say slash div. And one more thing, we need to have the role of this equal to an alert. OK, so that's our div for the alert. Now, inside of here, we need to actually show the message. So we're going to use two braces and we're going to say message. The reason we're doing that is because we're accessing this message variable right here. Then we're going to add a button that will allow us to dismiss this alert. So we're going to say button. We're going to say type is equal to button. And we're going to say class equals close. We're going to say data hyphen dismiss is equal to, and then you guessed it, alert. Then we're going to end the button. And inside of here, we're going to put a little icon that will allow us to actually uh, like show something nice for this button. So we're going to say span area hyphen hidden equals true. And then we're going to say this thing. So the ampersand sign, uh, which is right here, and then times semicolon and then slash span. Now, this is just a special character that is going to be like kind of a fancy X, uh, and it's just going to show it in this button. Uh, I can't really talk about it much more than that. That's, that's just what it's going to do. Now, this, however, though, is what we want to show if we have the category that is equal to error. So we have two types of alerts, right? We have an error alert and a successful alert. 
So if we want to show that we had an error, then we probably want to show it in red, right? Which is what alert danger means. And then if we had one that was successful, well, we want to show it successfully. We want to show it in green. So I'm going to copy this exact thing. I'm going to paste it again, but I'm going to change alert danger to alert success. Now, what this means is literally change the background color to green. That, that's the only difference between this and the other one. But now what I will do is I'm going to have some if statements inside of here that say, OK, well, if the category of this message was um, what do you call it error, then what do we want to do? Well, we want to show the error. If it is success, we want to show the successful message. So I actually need to change this to say for category comma message in messages. So we will loop through both of the things that we need. And then we'll do an if statement right here. So we'll say if category is equal to and then the string, which is uh, not danger, but error, then we will show this. So now we need to put our else statement right here. So percent else. So pretty much if you don't have error, we'll just show the success one. And then we need to end our four. So we can do that right here End four. So I know this is a lot of code, but this is how you show the flashed messages. So we start with the with messages equals flashed with categories equals true. We say if we have any messages, so if, if this is not equal to none, then let's loop through all of them. Let's check if the category of our message is error. If it is, then let's display an error message box. So alert danger. Otherwise, uh, let's display the success message box and we'll throw whatever the message actually is in that message box. And then uh, why do I have two and fours? Sorry, one of this should be and if. My bad on that. Uh, and there we go. That, that, that's all we need to actually show the flashed messages. Now, since I put this in the base template, this will now work on any of our pages. So if we flash flash messages, it doesn't matter where we flash them. They will always show up uh, because this is on the base template. So if I save this, it does this you know crazy formatting, which I hate um, that makes it way harder to read. But you get the idea. That is how you do this. And if you missed any of this, you can just go to the code in the description. All right. So now let's try this. Let's refresh. And let's submit. Now, notice that when we submit, the first thing it tells us is email must be greater than three characters. So let's go back to the code. All right, so we're here and we can see in sign up, the first thing we check is if the email is greater than three characters or not. Now, it obviously wasn't. Uh, so that's why we got that message. So now let's enter an email. Let's say Tim at Gmail. And let's press submit. And then it says first name must be greater than one characters. Or I guess I should just say one character. Let's actually change that. We get the idea. Now it's showing us these flashed messages. Now let's uh, input some valid stuff. So Tim at gmail.com, uh, Tim, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just so that we get past that limit. And now it says account created. Now, obviously, we didn't actually create the account, but that's the message that's flashed. And if you press the X button, it closes the message. So there you go. That is how you flash messages. Now, at any point in time in your program, now that we've implemented that code in base.html, if you ever want to notify the user of something, just flash a message and then choose whatever category you want to show. So error, success, and you're welcome to implement more categories as well. If you wanted to show like a gray message or, or stuff like that, uh, you just have to write some more HTML for that. OK, so now that we have that, let's talk about the database aspect. So we know how to flash messages. We know how to get information from the form. Let's do something with this, this info. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but still nothing crazy by any means. We're going to go into our init.py file. Actually, we're going to start setting up our database. So the first thing that we need to do is need to import SQL Alchemy. So we're going to say from flask underscore SQL Alchemy import and then all capitals SQL or SQL and then Alchemy. Now, this is what we're using for the database. And the first thing we need to do is define a new database. We're going to say DB equals SQL Alchemy and just initialize it like that. Underneath, we're now going to pick our database name. So we're going to say database. Uh, our DB name is equal to database.db. All right, so now we have the name and we have the database object. This is the object we're going to use whenever we want to add something to the database, uh, create a new user, whatever. We're going to use this object. You'll see how this works. So once we've done this, we now need to tell Flask that we are, in fact, using this database and where the database is going to be located, because we actually need a file to store all of this in. We're going to be using SQLite 3 to do this. So we need to say app.config, and then we're going to say uh, this is SQL Alchemy. I always spell this incorrectly. Underscore database underscore URI is equal to, and then we're going to do an F string. This is only going to work in Python 3.6 above, by the way, if, you, if this F string. Uh, if you don't understand the F string, I'll, I'll explain it in one second. But we're going to say SQLite uh, and then colon three slashes 
and then inside of brackets, db underscore name. So what I've just done here is I've said, okay, my SQLite or my SQL Alchemy database is stored or located at this location. So SQLite three or SQLite colon slash slash slash, and then wherever the database name is, which in this case we're calling database.db. You can call it whatever you want, but what this will do is it will store this database in the website folder. So inside of the directory that this init.py file is in. So we're just telling Flask where this is located. Now, what we're going to do after this is we're going to initialize our database by giving it our Flask app. So we're going to say db dot init underscore app like that. Now, again, what this is going to do is just going to take this database that we defined here and, and pretty much tell it, hey, this is the app we're going to use with this database, this Flask app that we just created. So now that we've done that, what we need to do is to find some database models or tables, right? If you've worked with a database before, then this is probably familiar to you. Uh, but if we want to store something in our database, we need to kind of define the schema of what that object is going to look like. So anyways, hopefully this is clear. Uh, yeah, the F string, if I didn't explain, when you put the F beforehand, you can use these squiggly brackets. And whenever you write inside of the squiggly brackets, uh, it can be like Python code and it will be evaluated as a string. So this is just going to evaluate to SQLite uh, colon slash 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 database.db because that's our DB name. All right, so now let's actually go uh, into our models.py file. And this is where we're going to create our database models. I'm going to do them both right now just to make things simple, but we want to have a database model for our users and we want to have a database model for our notes because we're going to be storing notes for this app, right? So I'm going to say import dot or sorry, not import dot from dot import DB. Now what I'm doing is I'm importing from the current package, which is this website folder, the DB object. Now not DB name, just DB. Notice that when I go to init.py, I have DB defined. This is what I'm importing because this is an init.py. If I say import from dot, uh, where, where even was I? From dot import db, that means from this package, and I can access anything in init.py, import db. So that, that's what we're doing when I say from dot. That would be equivalent if we were outside of this directly, directory from saying from website import db. Okay. So now that we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to say from flask underscore login module we've yet to use yet, import like that, user mixin. Now, this is just a custom class that we can inherit that will give our user object um, some things specific for our Flask login. Now, you don't really need to worry about what this is, but Flask login is just a module that kind of helps us log users in. And well, our user object needs to inherit from user mixin, which is what I'm importing right here. Anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to define a class. And whenever you want to make a new database model, so you want to store a different type of object, you're going to define the name of the object. Usually this is not plural. You're just going to make it uh, singular. And then you're going to have it inherit from db.model. So db again was that SQL alchemy object that we created. Now for our user object in particular, this is not for any other objects, just for the user object. What we're going to do is also inherit from user mixin. So now inside of here, what we will do is we will define all of the columns that we want to have stored in this table. So we're essentially defining a schema or a layout for some object that can be stored in our database. And we're saying, okay, this object's going to have what? Well, it's going to have an ID. It's going to have an email. It's going to have a password. What else do we want to store on it? Now it's just easier for me to do this all at once, but let's jump in. So I'm going to say ID is equal to DB dot column. And then I'm going to define the type of column. So for all of our objects, we need to have what's known as a primary key. Whenever you create an object in a database, we need some way to uniquely identify this object. So for all of my users, you know, they could potentially have the same email. Now we're going to make it so you can't have that, but let's say they had the same first name. We need some way to differentiate them. So we have something called a primary key, which is a unique identifier, typically an integer that represents our object and it's completely unique. No other object in this database table in this database table, sorry, will have the same ID. So I'm going to say DB dot integer. This is the type of column. And then I'm going to say primary key equals true. So our ID is our primary key, which again is the unique identifier. Now for all of our objects, we will have an ID. Sometimes you call it something else, but ID is what we're going to use. Next, what else do we want our user to store? Well, we want to have an email for our user want to have a password for our user, and then we want to store their first name. So I'm going to say email is equal to db.column. 
you're almost always going to have db dot column except for some specific cases. And then you're going to define the type of the column. So for our email, well, this is going to be a string. The maximum length of this string uh, we're going to say is 150. So whenever you define the string, you need to pick a maximum length for it. We're just going to go with 150. You can make it larger if you want. Doesn't matter. Then we're going to say unique equals true. When we define this, this means no user can have the same email as another user. So it is invalid to create a user that has an email that already exists. Then we're going to say password is equal to db dot column. And inside of here, we're going to say db dot string. And we're going to uh, again define how long we want this to be. I'll, I'll make max 150. Then we'll say our first name like that. And honestly, this should be camel case, sorry, is equal to and then db dot column. And then we'll say db dot string and make this 150 characters. OK, so now that we've done that, we've set up our user model. So we are going to store all of our users in a schema that looks like this. So we can have multiple users, obviously, and all of them are going to have an ID, an email, a password and a first name. That's what this defines right here. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to set up a uh, an object called note. So I'm going to say class note or sorry, a class called note non object. This is going to inherit from db.model, and this is going to be a much more general um, schema or much more general database model. Now, in case you're confused, a database model is just like a layout or a blueprint for an object that's going to be stored in your database. So when I say user, that means all my users have to conform to this right here. When I say note, this means all of my notes need to conform to what I have right here. You're just telling the database software that like all notes need to look like this. All users need to look like this. So, you know, all your information is always going to be consistent. Anyways, this user one was a bit different, right? Because we inherited from user Mixin. I'm not going to really I don't want to go in too much depth on what this means, but it's just to do with the fact that we're using this Flask login module. If we weren't using Flask login, we were doing this completely from scratch by ourselves. We wouldn't inherit from this class. Anyways, now we have class note uh, inherits from DB dot model. This is a much more general class. And what we're going to do is define very similar things to what we defined in user. So first we're going to say ID. All our notes need to have a unique ID is DB dot column DB dot integer and then primary key equals true. Now it's worth noting that by default, when you add a new object, you do not need to define its ID. It will automatically be set for you. So the database software is smart enough to just increment the IDs so that they're always unique. And the next ID inserted will simply be ID plus one of the last ID that was inserted in the database. All right. Now for our note, what do we want to store? Well, we want to store the data associated with the note. Now you could call this text too, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm going to say this is db.call, db.string, and our notes will be at most, uh, let's go 10,000 characters long. Now, you know, someone could make a note longer than that, but let's just go with 10,000 characters. And then we want the date that this note was created at. So db dot column, db dot, and then date time. And inside of date time, I'm going to say time zone equals true. So it's going to store time zone information as well. And then lastly, I'm going to say the default value of this field is going to be equal to, and then to import something now, I'm going to say from SQL alchemy dot SQL. You will already have this if you imported our sorry, if you installed Flask SQL alchemy and then I'm going to import funk. Now, this is very strange, but essentially what I'm doing here is I'm making it so that we don't need to specify the date field ourselves. We just let SQL alchemy take care of this. Whenever we create a new note, it will automatically add the uh, the date for us. Now we do that by saying the default is equal to funk dot. Now what funk does uh, is it just gets the current date and time, and it will just it will store that as the default value for our date. So whenever we create a new note object, it will just call funk, it will get whatever time it is, and then it will use that to store in the date time field, and it will store the time zone information of this date time object as well. All right, great. So we have that. Next, we are going to actually allow us to associate this note with our user. So all of our notes must belong to a user, right? Now, this is the point where I'm showing you how you associate different information with with different users. If we have notes and we want to have notes that are being stored for each user, like each user has multiple notes, we need to set up a relationship between this note object right here and our user object. Now we do this in the form of a foreign key. So a foreign key essentially is a key on one of your database tables tables that references an ID 
to another database uh, column. So a foreign key is essentially a column in your database that always references a column of another database. So in this instance, for every single note, we want to store the ID of the user who created this note. So I'm going to say user underscore ID is equal to DB dot column. And then inside of here, I'm going to say, well, what is the ID uh, field for my user? Well, it's an integer. So I need to match this because this user ID column here, our field is always going to store an ID of one of the users. So I'm going to say DB dot integer. And I'm going to say DB dot foreign key. Uh, did I spell foreign incorrectly? Yeah, I did foreign key. And then here we're going to say user dot ID. Now, this is where I need to kind of go into some more depth here. We're saying that the type of column is integer. And by specifying foreign key, what this means is we must pass a valid ID of an existing user to this uh, field or to this column when we create a note, note object. This is what we call a one to many relationship where we have one user that has many notes. Now, I don't really want to get too much into databases. This is something that you, you kind of need to look up on your own and learn about. That's not the purpose of this tutorial here. But when you have a one to many relationship, you have one object that has many children. Now, in this case, we have one user that has many notes. So what we do is we store a foreign key on the child objects that reference the parent object. So now every time we have a note, we can figure out which user created it by looking at the user ID. And again, this db.foreign key enforces that we must give a valid user ID to this object. Otherwise, we cannot create it because we have a relationship between the user and the note. Now, user.id, where am I getting this from? Well, the name of our tables by default are underscore. So in Python, we use capitals for the classes because that's the convention. But in SQL, this user class here will actually be represent, represented by user. So that's why I'm putting user here with a lowercase u. Now, ID, that's the field of this user object. So I, I'm referencing the ID field. If the primary key was represented by, say, like name or email, then I would do email. But you just put the, uh, the primary key of the other object that you're referencing or other table that you're referencing, in this case, user.id. Great. So now we have that. Uh, and now what this means is that from each note, we can reference who created it. But we don't just want that. We want from all users to be able to find all of their notes. So what we need to do now is we need to set up a field on our user that says notes and is equal to a DB dot relationship with what? Well, with the note table. Now, what this will do uh, is it will pretty much tell Flask and tell SQL Alchemy, do your magic. And every time we create a note, add into this user's notes relationship uh, that note ID. So this relationship field will really be a list and it will store all of the different notes. Now, that's not exactly how it's going to be represented, uh, but we will be able to access all of the notes that a user owns or has created from this notes field by denoting this DB dot relationship and then putting the name of the, uh, the other table that we're referencing. Now, notice that here it's capital. So, you know, it's not very consistent, but you do need capital for this one. Don't ask me why. It's just the way that SQL Alchemy works. When you do the foreign key, you have lowercase. And when you do the relationship, you're referencing the name of the class, which is obviously capital. So hopefully that's clear. I know I just went through a lot there. Um, there's just so much to talk about when it comes to making websites. So, uh, you know, it is difficult to go through everything in absolute depth. But this is the two database models that we're going to have. Now, if we wanted to have another one, we would just do the same thing. So we wanted to have, say, you know, maybe you could store videos on the platform or maybe you store reminders or whatever. We would just set up another class. So we would say class reminder. It would inherit from db.model. We would define all of the fields that we want to store for this reminder class. And you can look these up on Flask SQL Alchemy. And then we would add the foreign key to our user. Now, this foreign key that I showed you is only when you have a one to many relationship. So one user having many notes. Now, if you had a many to one, that means you can have like one note belonging to many users, right? So there's different um, relationships that you have between objects. I just showed you uh, one to many, which is the most common. You can also have one to one and uh, many to one. So you will have to look up how those work, but there's lots of documentation online. Anyways, we have finished that now. We did the database. Now what we need to do is we need to actually create this database. So we've set it up. 
We've defined what it will look like, but we need to create it. So we're going to go inside of init.py and we're going to write a little script that's going to check before we run this server every time if we have created the database yet. So the first thing we're going to do is after we uh, register our blueprints here, we're going to say from dot models and we're going to import our user and we're going to import our note. Now you could just import models like you could just just say import models like that, like either works, doesn't matter. Um, and, and sorry, it's not gonna be models, it's gonna be dot models, just like dot views and dot auth, because we're doing the relative import. The reason we import this is not because we're actually going to use anything. It is because we need to make sure that we load this file and that this file runs, this models.py file runs and defines these classes before we initialize or create our database. So we import the models file so that it defines these classes for us, and then we can go ahead and create our database. So I'm going to write a function. I'm going to say define create database, and this is going to take app. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to check if the database already exists, and if it does not, it is going to create it. Because if it does exist, we don't want to override it because it has data in it already. So we're going to go to the top of our program, and we're going to say from OS, which stands for operating system, uh, import path. And then what we will do is we will use this path module to determine whether or not the path to our database exists. So we'll say if not path, and then inside of here, we're going to say website, assuming you called your folder here website. If you change the name, you'd have to change that. And then plus db underscore name. Uh, and sorry, this is path dot exists. So if path dot exists website plus db underscore name, then db dot create underscore all app equals app. And then we will just print created database exclamation point. And then we'll run this function. So we'll just do it here. Create, no, not create app, create database. And then pass app. So the way this works, we use the path module, check if the database exists. If it doesn't exist, we create it. That's what db.create all does. The reason we need to pass app is because we need to tell Flask SQL Alchemy which app we're creating the database for, because obviously if it's a different app, then things are going to change. And this uh, app also has the SQL Alchemy database URI on it, which tells us where to create the database. So I'm going to save that. And now uh, we will have actually set up this Flask SQL Alchemy. All right. Yeah, whatever database, whatever you want to call it. So now let's run this. Uh, and from import dot models, what's wrong with import dot models? I might have to do from dot models import, uh, sorry, and then user. Actually, it's not that it's import dot models as models. OK, so the reason I got this error, it was saying I couldn't import dot models is because we need to, if we have a relative import, rename what we've imported this as is something that doesn't start with a period because I can't reference like I can't do dot models dot user. I can't reference the user class like that because I can't start a variable with a dot. So we just need to change the name that we import this as to something that doesn't start with a dot. So models. And now this should work. So import dot models as models because it's a relative import. So let's try this and still an error. Right? We might need to actually just do this from dot models import user and import, what do you call it? Uh, what was the other one we had? Note. So I guess I can't even do what I just did. I thought that was going to fix the issue. I don't often run into this, but I believe if we're uh, having a relative import, I guess we just have to use from and then import all of the classes or whatever we want from that. We also, I could get, guess could import star, which just means import everything. Let's, in fact, let's do that. So let's run this and now define create app uh, there's an issue with this. What's it saying? Line nine star only allowed at module level. Great. Okay. So let's not import star. I can't get past the damn import statement. Let's import user and let's import. What else was it? Note. Okay. I apologize about that guys, but issues do happen. Uh, yeah. Anyways, let's run this down. Okay. So all is working. Looks like this is the way we're going to have to import it. If any Python experts are there in the, uh, in the comments, please let me know why that wasn't working. And now, Let's go and refresh. OK, uh, OK, well, that was the post request that refreshed. Anyways, all is working on the website. Log in, log out, uh, sign up home. And now look, we have a database.db created in our directory. Awesome. So we now created these tables. 
Now that we've done this, we can actually do some more interesting coding. We can get out of this init.py file and we can start using our, uh, our sign up method right here, our sign up function to actually create an account. So in our else statement, so assuming all of this stuff is correct, what we're going to do is create a new user. So this is actually super simple. Uh, what we're going to do is we're simply going to say user or new underscore user is equal to user like that. We're going to say the email for this user is equal to email. We're going to say that the first name of this user is equal to the first name. And then we're going to say that the password is equal to, and then we're going to hold off for a sec because I need to import a few things. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a new user. This user is the user that I defined in my models.py file, right? So user right here. So what I need to do now inside of auth.py is I need to import that. So I'm going to say from dot models import user. So now I have the user imported. So now I can actually, you know, use this right here. But what I also need to do is I need to import a few things from Flask login that are going to allow me to hash a password. So I'm going to say from, and then this is workzberg or workzug, I don't know how you say this, uh, dot security import generate password hash and check password hash. So if you're unfamiliar with the hash, essentially it is a way to secure a password such that you are never storing a password in plain text. So you never want to store a password as what the actual password is. You want to somehow kind of change that password or convert that password into something that uh, is just much more secure. Now we, we call that a hash. Now I need to discuss what a hashing function is to explain a hash, but a hashing function is a one way function such that it does not have an inverse. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we have a function X maps to Y, let's say we have function F of X equals X plus one. Okay. Uh, this is a function that does have an inverse. Now the inverse of this function, or what is an inverse? Well, an inverse means given Y, which is X plus one, like X plus one would be Y. You are able to get back to X. So the inverse of F of X is F of Y is equal to Y minus one. Now what this function does is it takes Y and it maps it to X. The way this works is that if I know X plus one uh, is what gave me Y, then I know I can find what the original X was by just subtracting one from whatever this function gives me, right? So if F of X, if, if I call F of two and that gives me three, then I can say F of three and that gives me two, uh, then this function here, uh, let's, ju let's just call this G, sorry, or, or F prime, then F prime at three giving me two is the inverse of F of X. Now, uh, there's a lot of math going on here, um, but hopefully you get the idea. Essentially, if you're given the output, you can find the input. That, that's what an inverse is. Now, a hashing function is a function that has no inverse. That means that you can generate a hash with it. So given some X, it will always generate the same value Y, but given a Y, you cannot find what the X was. Now, the reason this is important is because when you generate a hash, what you do is you pass the password to this hashing function as X and it spits out some Y. But with that Y, you can never find what the original password was. You can only check if the password you type in is the correct password by running it through the same hashing function. So if I run my password that I'm you know, typing in to try to sign into account through a hashing function and it equals the hash, that means the password was correct. But if I'm just given the hash, there's no way for me to check what the password is. So hopefully that's clear. It's hard to explain without like writing anything out. I'm just, you know, typing in this editor. But the idea is that you're never storing the password in plain text. And if you hash the password, you can never return to the original password. You can only check if the password you type in equals the hash that's stored. That's how it works. So when we store our password, the whole point of this was to say, we're going to store it with a hash. We're going to generate password hash. And we're going to pass the password one here. We know that password one and password two will be the same. So it doesn't matter what we pass. And then we'll say the method is equal to and then SHA-256, which is just a hashing algorithm. Uh, you can pick a different hashing algorithm if you want, but just go with SHA-256 if you don't know uh, which one to choose. There's all kinds of videos online if you're more interested in hashing. It's actually a, uh, a pretty interesting thing. So anyways, now that we have that password defined, what we need to do is we need to add this uh, this account to our database. So we've defined the user, but if we want to actually add this to the database, what we need to type is the following db.session.add 
new user. What this means is add the new user to the database. Then what we need to do is we need to make a commit to the database. So we need to pretty much say, hey, we've made some changes to the database, update it. We do that by saying db.session.commit. So now that we've done that, we're all good. And this will actually create a new user for us. So after we create the new user, we will flash the message saying, hey, account was created, awesome, success. And then we are going to redirect the user to the home page of the website because after they create their account, we should sign them in and then they should be redirected to the home page. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to import from Flask something called redirect and something called URL for. So I think these are pretty intuitive to understand uh, what I'm going to do with them. But what we're going to do after we flash this message in the, uh, the else statement here is we are going to return a redirect to the URL for the home page. That's what we're going to write. So we're going to say return redirect, which means redirect us to another page. And then we're going to say, where do we want to redirect? Well, we want to redirect to the URL for views.home. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because views is the name of my blueprint. So we go here, we have views. Home uh, is the name of my function. So I'm finding what URL maps to this function. Now I could just put in a slash, like I could redirect uh, to just a slash here and this would work the same. But that means if I ever changed the URL uh, and oops, uh, this, sorry, this should not be in a string, this URL for, sorry, that means if I ever were to change the URL for that home function, I would need to come in here and change this. So it's better to use URL for and just do the blueprint name and the function name that you want to go to. That way, if the root for that ever changes, this will pick it up. So that's what this do, this is doing. It's just finding the URL associated with this function. All right. So now that we have this, what's going to happen is we're going to actually create the account uh, and then it's going to redirect us to the home page after we send the post request um, from signing up. So let's create an account. Let's actually, I need to rerun the web server here. So let's do that. And now if I go here, I will refresh, I will go to sign up and let's make an account. So let's say Tim at gmail.com. Let's go Tim, make our password pretty basic. Does need to be at least seven characters. Then we'll press submit. And it says first name is an invalid keyword argument for user. Okay, interesting. So that means that we must have messed something up in our models file. So let's go to models.py. And what does it say here? Uh, first underscore name. That's why. Okay. So now let's go to views.py or, or auth.py. And I realized that I've just, I've just named this argument wrong. So I need to say first underscore name equals first underscore name. Uh, and did I, ah, so let's go to here. Okay. So I just changed this to be first underscore name instead of the camel case first name, which I should have done anyways. Uh, that was just a habit, I guess, to do it the other way. Uh, but yeah, we have first underscore name equals first underscore name. And in case I wasn't clear here, you just define all of the fields that you have in models.py and then you set them equal to whatever they're equal to, right? Which is what we did. Anyways, let's run this now. Uh, let's just refresh because this should just resubmit the post request. Uh, and then first name is not defined. Where is this? Uh, oh, Elif Lena first name. Of course, we, we need to change this. So let's go first underscore name. Okay. And let's refresh, continue. And now it's the issue. DB is not defined. Of course, DB is not defined. We didn't import DB. So these are the kind of issues you run into. All right. So now we have to import DB. So we're going to say from dot import DB. Great. And that's again from the init.py file. We already showed that previously. Okay. So now we have everything imported that we needed. Uh, hopefully this should work. Let's refresh and send again. And there we go. Account created. That means we actually did create this account and it redirected us to the home page. So now what we need to do is we need to actually kind of signify the fact that a user is signed in and has created an account. We need to let a user log in, right? Or sign in now that they have the account. So let's do that. Let's handle the sign in uh, form now or the login form. So inside of here, I'm just going to start kind of coding some stuff out. I'm going to say if request.method equals equals post. So if we are actually signing in and we're not just getting the page, we want to get the email and the password from the form. So we're going to say email equals request.form.get and then we want the email and then we're going to say password equals and then request.form.get and then of course we want the password. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the user email that we've typed in here or that was sent to us in this form is valid. If we actually have a user that has that email in the database. Now this is going to show you how you actually kind of query the database and look for specific entries. So I'm going to say user 
is equal to user, which is the database name, right? And then dot query dot filter by. This is what you do when you are looking for a specific entry in your database or a specific user, whatever it is, and, and you want to look by a specific column or by a specific field. So I'm going to say email equals email. Now this means filter all of the users that have this email right here. That's what I'm saying. If I was looking by ID, I can say ID equals and then whatever the ID was. Okay, so email equals email. And I'm going to say dot first. What this will do is return the first result. Now there should only be one result if there is any results because we might not have a user that has this email. But if we do, we should only have one because each user must have a unique email. So what we'll do now is we'll say if user. So if we did actually find a user, then we need to check if the password they typed in is equal to the hash that we have stored on the server. So we're going to say if check underscore password hash, we're going to pass the user dot password, uh, which is whatever user we found here, whatever their password is, we access with dot password. If I wanted to access their email, I would say dot email. If I wanted to access their name, I would say first underscore name. So we say user dot password and then password, which is the password that we got from the form. So if this is the case, if these hashes are the same, which is what this function will do is just compare, it will it will hash this password and then check it against this password essentially. If that's the case, we logged in successfully. So let's say flash, and then we'll say logged in, and then successfully like that, okay? And I'll just do an exclamation point, category equals success. Okay, now if that's not the case, then we need to make sure that we tell the user, hey, no, you, you didn't log in, that was incorrect, wrong password, whatever. So if the password is wrong, then let's flash a message and let's say incorrect uh, password like that, maybe try again, okay? And then category is gonna be equal to error. And then if the user doesn't exist, then we need to tell them that, hey, there, there was no user with that email. So we're gonna say flash and then email does not exist and then category equals error. Okay. And that's all we need for this. But before I do this, it just reminds me one thing when I was writing this, we need to make sure that when we sign up a user, that that user does not already exist, right? We need to make sure that the email they're using doesn't already exist or a user doesn't already have that email. So the first thing we're going to do inside of here is the exact same thing we just did here. We're going to say user equals user dot query dot filter by email equals email dot first. I'm going to copy that. This is going to be our first line. And now we'll change this to an elif uh, and we'll go, uh, actually, we'll just go user and then we'll say if user. So if there actually is a user, then we'll just tell them, hey, no, this email already exists. Okay, so now we will say the category equals and then error. Great, so that's gonna make sure, uh, we'll query the user, make sure that we're not uh, signing up users with the same email. Okay, sweet, so now we have that. So the login and sign up forms are, are pretty much done. Let's go back to the website after I rerun this here. I guess it crashed for some reason. Uh, and let's give this a refresh. So now let's let's just uh, log out, it doesn't do anything, but we, we can go to login and let's see if we can create a new account with another email and then sign in. So let's try with tim at gmail.com, which I think is an email that already exists. And in fact, let me just submit this and notice it tells me already email already exists. So great, that's working, all is good. So actually let's sign in as that user. So tim at gmail.com. I'm gonna type an incorrect password and incorrect password, try again, awesome. So now let's try again, tim at gmail.com. 1234567, which is the password, and logged in successfully. So that did actually work. Now, again, I know this isn't really bringing us anywhere, but that's the next step. So now that login and sign up is working, first of all, from login, if we log in successfully, we need to redirect the user to the home page. So we're going to say return redirect URL for views.home, just like we did in the sign up page. All right, awesome. So we're getting very close to being done here. Um, I mean, we have to add the notes and stuff, but like we've done most of the hard stuff already. Now that we can log in and we can sign up, we need to be able to log out. We also need to make it so that you can't access the home page unless you're signed in, right? We want to prompt you to log in or to sign up for an account uh, if you haven't done so already. So now we need to make it so that, first of all, you don't see this home button if you're not logged in. 
You can't access this homepage if you're not logged in. And if you're logged in, it probably shouldn't say log in or sign up at the top. It should probably only show you home and log out. So how are we going to do that? Well, this is where we're going to use Flask login. So this is makes life super easy. I, I love the fact that this module exists. We're going to start by just importing Flask login. So we're going to say from Flask underscore login, import login user, import uh, actually login required. Yeah, import login required and import log out user. Awesome. So these are the functions we're going to use to log in our user. We're also going to import something called current user, which is going to represent or hold the current user. Now, this is the reason why we needed to in our models file have this user mix in so that we can use this current user object here to access all of the information about the currently logged in user. So anyways, uh, what we're going to do now is inside of login, after we log in, we're going to say login user. We're just going to pass our user like that. So the user that we found here that we have the correct password for, this is the user we're logging in. That's all we need to do. This is going to log in the user. Last thing, we'll say remember equals true. Now what this does is this remembers the fact that this user is logged in uh, until the user, I guess, clears their browsing history or their session. Uh, this is going to store in the Flask session. So after you restart the Flask web server, this will no longer be true. But if the web server is running, uh, it's hard to describe when this is, is not going to remember the user. But essentially, just think of it as unless some circumstance occurs where the user like clears their browsing history or the web server restarts, Flask is going to remember that this user was already logged in, so they don't need to log in every single time they go on the website. Anyways, login user, user, remember equals true. Now we're going to do the same thing. So just copy this line in sign up. So after we successfully sign up user, we're going to log them in as well because, well, they should be logged in after they create their account. And then we'll now do the log out function or the log out uh, route here. So in log out, what we want to do, first of all, is we want to return the redirect for the URL for, and then we're going to just redirect uh, to auth.login, which is uh, just going to be this right here. We're doing that because after they log out, usually you just bring them back to the sign in page, right? And then all we're going to do inside of here is we're going to say log out user. And we don't need to pass a user. We just say log out user and it will log out the current user. Now, lastly, we're going to add a decorator to this, uh, this function here that says log in underscore required. Now, all this does is this make sure that we cannot access this page or this route unless the user is logged in. And this makes sense, right? We don't want to be able to log out if we're not logged in. Now, that's not going to cause an issue, but it just makes sense to add this decorator. So we will. So we have that for logout now. And now I'm going to copy this line. I'm going to go to views.py. I'm going to show you how we can do this in here. So now all we need, we don't need login or uh, log out user. We'll get rid of those. We're going to keep login required and current user though. And we're going to add a login required decorator to our home page. So now you cannot get to the home page unless you log in. And there you go. Now, the last thing we need to do here when we're using Flask login is we need to tell our, uh, our Flask in general how we actually log in a user, how we find a user. So we need to go to our, our init.py file. And inside of here, we're going to say at the very top from Flask underscore login import login manager. Login manager is what it says. It's, it's going to help us manage all of the logging in related things. So at the top here under db.init app, we're going to say the following. We're going to say login underscore manager equals login manager, just like that. We're then going to say login underscore manager dot login view. So where do we need to go if we're not logged in? So essentially, where should Flask redirect us if the user's not logged in and there's a login required? Well, we want to redirect to auth.login, name of our template, name of our function, right? And then we're going to say login underscore manager dot init underscore app, and then pass it the app. So telling the login manager which app we are using. Then lastly, we're going to define a function here. We're going to say at login manager underscore manager dot user loader. And we're going to say define load underscore user. It's going to take an ID. And inside of here, we're going to return the user dot query dot get int ID. Now I'm going to describe this in a second, but sorry, take all this code and we need to put it below uh, when we import this model here. So actually below the database, after we create the database, 
then we're going to do this. Now, I'll go through this, but I, I think these three lines are straightforward. What this is doing is this is telling Flask how we load a user. Now, user.query.get, this works very similar to filter by, except by default, it's going to look for the primary key. So when you use get, you don't have to specify like ID equals ID. It just knows that it's going to look for the primary key and check if it's equal to whatever we pass, which is the int version of whatever ID is passed to this load user. Now, you don't really need to know much more about this, but we're just pretty much telling telling Flask here what user we're looking for. We're looking for the user model and we're going to reference them by their ID. And that's what this decorator here is doing. Uh, it's saying, you know, use this function to load the user. If you had more advanced loading of users, then obviously you would have to change this function. But hopefully that's clear. Again, it doesn't matter too much if you understand that or not. It's just what you have to use for login manager and for, uh, for Flask login. Okay, so now that we have that, I think that's pretty much all we need. So let's rerun this here and let's check if this is working. So let's refresh. Uh, please log in to access this page. Notice we're getting that popping up. So to access this page, that's I, I'm, I don't know why it's showing me this message because I don't think we um, we implemented this anywhere. But if I go to home, it keeps saying that. Log out. I mean, it's not doing anything because login is required, right? If I go to sign up, I can sign up. Go to login, I can log in. So let's log in. Tim at gmail.com. And let's go with my password and boom, logged in. Now we can access the home page. Awesome. So now if I go to log in, I mean, it brings me there. I can go back to the home page because I'm currently logged in. And if I log out, it redirects me to the login page and I can no longer access the home page. So that is how that works. That's what Flask login does for us. It kind of manages what pages we can access and what ones we can't and stores the fact that users logged in or not. So now I want to show you how we can change this nav bar so it only displays the correct icons. So this current user thing uh, that I had imported in views.py, this is what we're going to use to detect whether a user is logged in or not. So this current user has a bunch of attributes. If the user is logged in, it will give us all the information about the user. So their name, their notes, their email, anything on the user model we can access from current user. If the user is not logged in, uh, then it will tell us that this user is, I believe, what's known as an anonymous user, and it is not currently authenticated because we've not signed in. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass to our home template user equals and then current user. Now, what this means is that we will be able to, in our template, reference this current user and check if it's authenticated. So let's go to our home.html template. And inside of here, uh, actually not home, sorry, let's go to base.html. And inside of base.html, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my nav bar and I'm going to do some if statements and only show some of these links if the user signed in. So I'm going to do uh, if like this. So if and then user dot is underscore authenticated like that. Did I spell authenticated correctly? I think I did. So if they're authenticated, then all we're going to show is log out in home, right? So let's do that here. We will show um, home first, probably, and then log out after. So we'll put home above. Then otherwise, so inside of here, we'll go percent percent else, and then percent percent and if. Okay, so otherwise, so if they're not logged in, then we'll show the login and sign up buttons. Um, if they are, then we only show those. So now that we have that, that's all we need to do to handle the nav bar. We just need to make sure that whenever we render this base template, which is in all the templates, we pass the current user. I'm going to save that. I'm going to go to auth now. I'm going to do the same thing for my render template. So I'm going to get rid of Boolean here. And for login, I'm now going to pass user equals current user. Same thing for my log out. Although actually, no, I don't need to do it for log out. Sorry, just for sign up. Now I'm going to pass user equals current user. So now if we have access to the current user, uh, we can use it in our template and then we'll display the correct thing for the nav bar. So let's rerun this and let's go to our website and let's refresh. So now notice that those two things went away. We're not uh, logged in, so we only have login and sign up. But if we log in, so tim at gmail.com and uh, what was the password? OK, then we get home and we get log out. And now I can go to the home page, obviously, or I can log out and it redirects me here. So that is how you do that. Awesome. So now that we have that, what I want to do is I want to talk about adding notes. Uh, and yeah, and then at that point, we're going to be pretty much done. So let's go to our home page 
And we're just going to add kind of that little form or the little UI aspect to allow a user to add notes. And we'll also have to display all of the notes as well. So let's start by allowing user to create a note. So we're going to make a form. So we're going to say form and then method equals post like that. And then here we'll say slash form. Now we need to make a text area for the notes. So we're going to say text area. Uh, we'll say name is equal to note. ID is equal to note and the class will be equal to form hyphen control. Then we will end the text area and then what we'll do, we will create a button. So we're going to say div, we're going to say align equals center just to put this button in the middle of the screen. We're going to end the div. We're going to add a button. We're going to say button type equals submit class equals BTN BTN hyphen primary. We're going to say add note, and then we're going to end the button. All right, so now we have a form. And when we press this, uh, it will send a post request to our URL uh, with the note. Okay, so now that we have the form. Let's write some code that can actually generate or show all of the notes. So first, I'm going to make an h1 tag, uh, and I'm going to say align equals center. And I'm going to end the h1. And then I'm going to say that this is notes. And then under here, I'm going to write a list group that's going to allow me to show all of the different notes. So first, I'm going to make UL, uh, which is like what you do for list. I'm going to say class. This is a bootstrap class list hyphen group list hyphen group hyphen flush. Uh, and then we're going to say ID equals notes. Then we will end the UL and we're going to do a for loop to loop through all of the notes. So I'm going to say percent percent for user dot notes. Now remember, we're always passing user, right? And since we're passing user, what we can do is we can access all of the notes associated with the user because they have that. Uh, if we go to models up high here, they have a notes field that is actually going to store all of our notes. So we're going to say for note in user dot notes, we're going to end the for so we don't forget. And then what we'll do is we'll just display the note dot data. So we'll say note dot data like that. And the data again is just the text associated with the note. We also could uh, display the date of the note, but I'm not going to do that for right now. Okay, so now that we have that, uh, let's just put this inside of an li tag, sorry, just so it shows up nicer. And I will change the li tag. So we have a class here. So for li, I am going to say uh, class equals list hyphen group hyphen item. Sweet. Okay, so now that we have that, we should actually display all of the notes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find a word here just in a list and that should be good. Okay, so now we'll display the notes. Then we have this form. So let's go to the home page and see how this looks. Uh, so let's sign in, I guess, Tim at gmail.com. And there we go. And now notice we have add note methods not allowed. That makes sense. And then we have the note field like this. Now, for some reason, my Oh, well, it would be helpful if I spelled class correctly. I was like, my, that looks really bad. <laughs> Anyways, let, now we have the button that's proper. But what I want to do is in between the text area and the div, I'm just going to add a break line just so there's a bit of space. So BR and then slash. And now let's refresh this and notice we, okay, that's much better. That looks a lot better. So moving on, let's make it so that we can actually add a note. Now we kind of already know how to do this. Uh, we're at the point where you guys, you know, you could probably go off on your own now. Let's go to uh, views.py and we're on the home page. We now need to make it so that the uh, the post method is allowed for this root. So I'm going to say methods equals and then get and then post. All right. So now we'll check if the request dot method and we need to import request. So let's import request like that is equal to post. So if request dot method equals equals post, then what we need to do is get the notes. We're going to say note is equal to request dot form dot get note. I'm going to go a bit faster because we've done this a few times now and we're going to get the note and we're just going to make sure that this note is at least length one. So we're going to say if the len of note is greater than or equal to one or sorry, is less than one, then we will flash. Uh, note is too short. And then I guess we'll just go with category equals error. Okay. Otherwise, what we will do is we will flash note added category equals success. And then obviously we're going to have to actually add the note. So how do we add the note? 
So to add the note, what we need to do is we need to say new underscore note is equal to note, which means we need to import that. So we're going to say from dot models import note. And then we're going to say for this, well, the data of our note is equal to note. So whatever the text is that was passed for the form. And then the user ID uh, of our note is equal to current user dot ID because with the current user, we can access any of the fields on it, like the ID. So that will create our note. There's nothing more we need to pass to this. And then we will say uh, db dot session dot add new underscore notes. And then lastly, db dot session dot commit. And then uh, I guess we actually don't need to add anything. We just do that. Then we will flash a note added. We will return back to the home page and we will render that note. So I believe that's all we need uh, to actually add the note. I think that should be good. And then, yeah, you'll see it and it will show up on the page. Awesome. Now that we have that, uh, one more thing that we need to do is we need to import DB. So we're going to say from dot import DB. I knew I was missing something and let's rerun the web server. So now let's see if we can create a new note. So let's go and let's refresh and let's say hi, add note and name flash is not defined. Okay, we need to import that. So from flask, let's import flash. Uh, now let's refresh, continue and notice that we added. Now we added it twice just because the, the post request was sent twice, uh, but there we go. So we added it on. Now what I want to do is show you how to delete the note. So let's just go hello and make sure this one works. Notice hello is now added. And now I will show you how to delete them. So let's go to home.html and I'm going to add a button for all of our notes that allow us to delete it. So underneath note.data, but still inside of our li here, we're going to say button type equals, and then this will just be button class equals close, and then on click equals. And we're going to call a JavaScript method, which uh, we'll write in one second, our JavaScript function. Then we will uh, end our button. So slash button, and we will add that little icon. That's the X that we used previously. So we're going to say span and then area. Oops, hyphen hidden, which means like just don't show this uh, equals and then true and then end the span. And then we're going to do that little fancy symbol again. So ampersand times semicolon save that. And now we need to write the JavaScript function we're going to call. Uh, You'll see why we need to do this, but this is kind of the way that we would delete something. I'm, I'm trying to find the words to describe this. I, I'm just going to do this and then you'll see kind of why we need to do it. But since we're not submitting form data and instead when we press the button, we want to send a request to the back end. This is kind of a standard way to do this. There is, of course, other ways to do this, but we just write a little bit of JavaScript that will send a request to the back end for us uh, that will delete the uh, the note. So we're going to say delete note is the name of the function we're going to write. And then inside of here, we're going to do two squigglies and we're going to write note.id. So the reason for this is that we need to be able to figure out which note we're deleting. And of course, we want to delete the note with whatever ID is in this field. So we need a way to figure out which note we pressed on. And the way we do that is since we're in the for loop, we're going to say that on click, we call the delete note with note ID. So I, I feel like I'm explaining this very poorly, but we will have a function in JavaScript called delete note that will take in a note ID. We are specifying that we want to pass the ID of the note that we're showing in this list column or this list row. And then that way, when we press on the close button in this row, it will send the note ID associated with this note and we will delete that note from the database. So let's save that. Uh, for some reason, it's giving me some some red squiggly lines here. I think this should be good. I'm just double checking to make sure I did everything successfully or correctly. I think I did. Let's go now to our index.js. Now, remember, I showed you how to add this um, in the beginning part of the series in case you're or series in the beginning part of the video. Uh, in case you're forgetting how to do that, if you go to base.html, this script tag right here uh, is referencing this index.js file, which we have stored in the static folder. So make sure you have this line in your base template at the very bottom and that it looks like this and that you name your file index.js unless you modify that line. Anyways, inside of here, let's write what we need. So we're going to say function delete note. We're going to take a note ID. And we're going to send a request. So to send a request in vanilla JavaScript, you use fetch 
And then we are going to send it to an endpoint we've not yet created called delete note. Uh, and inside of here, we're going to pass the method. So we're going to say method equals post. We want to send a post request. And the body uh, is json.stringify. And we're going to send note ID and then being note ID. Now, I'm just going to type this out, then I, then I will explain it. Don't worry. We're just going to say underscore res. And then we're going to make an arrow function. I'm going to say window dot location equals, sorry, uh, dot href equals and then slash. OK, so what this is going to do is it's going to take the note ID that we passed and it's going to send a post request to the delete note endpoint, which we've yet to write, which we'll write in a second. And then after it gets a response from this delete note endpoint, it's going to reload the window. This is how you reload the window with the get request specifically. So window.location.href equals slash just means redirect us to the home page, which in turn will just redirect the page or sorry, refresh the page. So that's what this is doing. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand the JavaScript. This is all we need to delete the uh, the note. And this is just how you send a really basic uh, request to the back end from JavaScript. We're not using Ajax or anything like that. So let's go now to views.py and we need to make another view. So we're going to say at views dot and then root. And we're going to call this one. We do need methods actually. We're going to call this one delete note. Now methods is going to be equal to post and it's only going to be post. There's no get request we can send here, just post. And we're going to say define delete and then underscore note. And what we're going to do is we're going to look uh, for the note ID that was sent to us. Now, it's interesting how we have to do this because we're sending the request not as a form. So the request is actually going to come in in the data parameter of our request object, which you will see in a second, which means we need to load it as JSON. So I need to import JSON, which is built into Python. So import JSON up top. And we're going to say that the note is equal to uh, JSON dot loads. And then we're going to load uh, the request dot data. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, note ID, sorry, is equal to, and then this is going to be data at note. So what this is going to do is it's going to take this request data, which is a string. This string is what we just sent uh, from here. So it's going to be note ID and then note ID. And, and what this does, what this does, json.stringify is it turns this into a string. So we need to now take the string from views.py, turn it into a Python dictionary object. So we can then access the note ID, which is going to come in as the field note ID. And then what we're going to do is find this note. So we're going to say note is equal to, and then note.query.get, and then note ID. So again, when you use get, it accesses the primary key, which is uh, what, we're, what we have here anyways. So if we found a note, so if note does exist, then what we will do is we'll say if note dot user underscore ID equals current user dot ID, then db dot session dot delete note. This is how you delete an object. You query it and then you just put it inside of the delete there. Don't know. I added a semicolon uh, and that will delete it. Then you say db dot session dot commit and then we can just return something. So I'm just going to return J jsonify, which I'll import in a second. Uh, with an empty response. Now I'm going to talk about all this. Don't worry. I know I'm going fast, but at the top, just import JSONify and let's discuss this. So this that I just wrote here, what this is doing is it is going to take in some data from a post request. It's going to load it as a JSON object or a Python dictionary. We're then going to access the note ID attribute, which again is right here. What we'll do then is we'll say note.query.get. So we'll look for the note that has that ID. Check if it exists, first of all. If it does exist, then um, of course we can delete it. If it doesn't, we don't need to delete it. And then what we'll do is we'll say, well, if we own this note, so if the user who is signed in does actually own this note, because we don't want to let users who are signed in delete other people's notes, right? Uh, then we will delete the note. So just a little security check. And then what we'll do is we'll return an empty response. Now we just need to do this because we do need to return something from these views. We're not returning HTML here. We're just returning an empty response that is either saying, hey, you know, it was successful or it didn't work or, or whatever. And in fact, at the very bottom here, we can just return JSONify no matter what. Uh, and we're just JSONifying an empty Python dictionary, which essentially means 
turn this into a JSON object that we can return. And well, we're not returning anything, but we just need to return something. It's just like a requirement from Flask. So anyways, that's all we need to do. That should now delete our notes. Uh, so now let me get out of this. Let me run the server. And what's the issue here? Uh, if note, ah, I used one equal sign, this should be two equal signs. Okay, let's rerun this. So I just had one equals that needs to change to two. Now, if we refresh, uh, I don't want to do that. Let's just do this. Notice that we have our X's now. And if I press my X, uh, no, the requested URL was not found on the server. Hmm, interesting. So it looks like we must have sent the wrong URL. Uh, name data is not defined. Oh, oops, sorry guys, this should be note. Uh, first of all, that should be note. So that will fix one of the errors. And let's see what other error we had. Delete note was not found on the server. It should have been found on the server. We have delete note here. Hmm, interesting. Okay, I'm just gonna try this again and see what's wrong. Let's refresh. Let's go back to slash home. Oh, that's why. We don't wanna go to slash home. We just wanna go to slash. And I think the issue is in index.js. No? no, I'm just looking around for the problem here. For some reason, we got redirected to slash home. I don't know why that happened. Um, anyway, sorry, let's let's just try this again. Okay, so let's refresh. Let's try to delete a note. It says it was not found on the server. Hmm, okay, I'll be right back after I look for this. All right, so I fixed the error. It was actually just a caching issue with my like previous version of this project before I started the tutorial. Uh, so you guys shouldn't run into that issue. There's nothing that you need to fix. I just cleared my browser cache by going up here and pressing empty cache and hard reload uh, when my console was open. Anyways, uh, now we can delete notes. So if I go test and I add it, I can press the X and it deletes the note. So that is actually it. That's all I wanted to show you. That has been this tutorial. Now this took us almost two and a half hours. I do apologize that this was a long time, but I hope you guys can appreciate the effort here the amount of time I just sat in front of the camera and, and talked to you. Uh, and that this gives you a really good start on your project. Uh, this again is how you create user accounts, how you actually associate information with users. Uh, and I'm really hoping that now you're going to have, you know, some strong fundamentals in Flask and, and have a nice template project. And you can get, you guys can go out and build uh, your own interesting website. So anyways, that is it. I'm going to leave it here. If you guys enjoyed, please do make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. And of course, I will see you in another YouTube video.